and that we can have a good input from everyone. Talks are all right, but I think inputs, physical inputs are much more important. So with that, uh, I request Kiran to please start off. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll introduce you to our uh, master of ceremony, Dr. Vaishali. She will just uh, introduce us to the next sessions and the speakers who will be presenting the talks. Dr. Vaishali. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I welcome all the delegates and uh, my colleagues for the meet. Uh, so I welcome our first speaker, Dr. Purvi Agarwal, ma'am who is a pediatric uh, endocrinologist from Nyan Hospital. She will be talking about bone health in children. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
produce this cell. These are just two percent of bones, just two tiny two percent of bone composition. However, they are the master players. They they influence how the bone is formed or bone is resolved. So basically, osteoblasts are mainly bone forming cells. Osteoclasts are bone resorbing cells, and these osteocytes control whether bone will be formed or will be resolved. So this figure. How much so ever complicated it may look like. However, it will take us through our further course. In short, osteoblast will form bone, osteoblast will resolve the bone, and osteocytes will control these two cells. So the cellular component, the organic matrix after which collagen forms the 90% of proteinaceous organic matrix, non-collagenous other proteins, and proteoglycan. The inorganic salts after which calcium and phosphorus is a major chunk. However, other salts like uh, magnesium bicarbonate are equally important. So let me ask you: Have you ever wondered that why our bones stop growing in size after puberty? Yes, you can argue with me that uh, longitudinal growth will fuse after every piece of plate has fused. But why do they stop growing in the thickness as well? Have you ever wondered why? So this is the process of modeling and remodeling. That during this growth period, we grow in length as well as thickness because of endosteal growth and periosteal growth. However, as we age, the bone is resolved from the endosteal surfaces. It is formed on the periosteal surfaces. However, since it, it keeps on remodeling, we stop growing in the thickness as well after puberty ages. This figure, given by National Osteoporosis Foundation, summarizes our life of bone in a very nice pictorial format. That is, that we begin with almost zero bone mass in utero. We continue to acquire good amount of bone mass till our second decade, male and female. And after that, how much ever do we take care of it? How much ever good nutrition we have? We are going to lose some amount of bone some amount of bone mass every single passing year. So, to summarize, around, so this is the time frame we have, which will define our further life, which will define our old age. By around second decade, we form our peak bone mass, and by after this around fifth or fourth decade, we start losing bone mass very exponentially, especially more in females due to menopause. So this process of modeling, which happens in the pediatric age group, which we are responsible to look after and which will be responsible for our further life, takes place in the first two decades of modeling, which is responsible for bone growth. This is how it keeps on growing in length as well as thickness. However, remodeling, that is resorption, takes precedence after second decade, and hence we lose bone mass with each passing year. Let me ask you another wondrous question. I said that till second decade, we keep on acquiring bone mass exponentially that too. Then why are fractures so very common in 11 to 15 years of age? And that too, boys fracture more than girls. Why that figure showed that uh, boys have higher growth uh, bone mass? Then why do we fracture so much? Why do we see so much fracture when we are acquiring such high bone mass? Have we ever wondered why? So this figure also summarizes it. Then why girls are growing their peak height velocity, the age at which bone mass, peak bone mass is achieved, has a lag period of almost two years. And similar is with the boys, that while they are growing very fast in height, the peak bone mass is yet to be achieved. And this lag period of around two to three years makes them much more prone for fractures in the pediatric age group, even though they are acquiring bone mass at such exponential rates. So as I said that, yes, they are males and females, both genders are acquiring their peak bone mass in the first two decades. But what is this? The lifestyle factors are such important contributor to the same that almost 20 to 30 percent of your peak bone mass can be influenced by lifestyle factors which can make you, if you have suboptimal lifestyle, it can prevent you from forming such good bone mass. 
So genes, yes, they do play a very important role. Probably 70 to 80 percent of your peak bone mass is defined by genes, but other factors like hormones, nutrition, lifestyle, all play a very important interlinked role in defining what your peak bone mass is. So today we are all going to discuss about bone health and that too in the peak period. Why am I discussing about this peak period? Because we pediatric physicians are responsible for controlling it and also the peak bone mass that we achieve during these two decades will define our life further on. So there are some non-modifiable factors which probably we cannot control but do affect our bone mass which is ethnicity, sex, age of maturation and genetic factors. Some modifiable factors where we definitely can intrude upon are nutrition, physical activity, endocrine factors, systemic conditions and lifestyle factors. Let's take a look at each of them separately. So ethnicity. It's very much well proven and known that African Americans have much more higher bone mineral density than Americans. Caucasians have higher bone mineral density than Asians. But this is how ethnicity plays a role and probably we cannot do anything about it. Sexual factors. That figure itself said that males do have a certain degree of advantage when bone mineral density is concerned. But where is this advantage apparent? Both the sexes, males and females, are born with probably same amount of bone mineral density and goes parallel till puberty is attained. In the pre-pubertal period, even if they exhibit somewhat higher bone mass, it is probably due to more cross-sectional area or probably thicker bones. When adjusted to weight and cross-sectional area of this uh, bone, they have almost equal bone mineral density. However, it is during this pubertal years that this difference is much more apparent and males have higher content as well as density of bone mineral density than females. Let's see how does the age of maturation affect our bone mineral density and further life. It was proven by this study by Popper that as compared to girls who attain puberty at normal age, the girls who attained puberty at earlier age had much higher bone mineral density. But what was paradoxical was that this, this difference was observed only in females and not in males. However, this difference was observed in total body and not other uh, specific areas of bone mineral density like spine, femoral, neck. But there was much more apparent difference when compared with the total mineral bone, uh, bone density at the total body side. What is paradoxical is that whether girls go into early puberty, they have an advantage, not with the boys. However, late puberty is detrimental to both, even girls, even boys. That if girls enter late uh, puberty at later ages, they are at disadvantages. Same goes with the boys, that later puberty puts them at a disadvantage for bone mineral density, which was proven by almost 0.2 percentage lesser on DEXA scan. So as I told that this figure will take us through the whole presentation today. In the absence of estrogen during these peak growing years, these osteocytes undergo apoptosis, osteoblastogenesis increases, osteoblastogenesis decreases, and hence the net result is of bone loss, and hence Delayed puberty can be really detrimental to both of them. Similar goes with the drugs that inhibit estrogen can increase bone resorption. However, this is the case where menopausal women are supplemented with the estrogen or men are supplemented with estrogen modulated drugs that can improve your bone mineral density. Last non-modifiable factor that is genetic factor probably playing the most a uh, major chunk of your uh, capacity to attain peak bone mass. So we said that these 2% cellular component are like master blasters. They are deciding your fate. So any problem, any genetic problem in these two or these three cells will be your defining factor, right? So having a closer look, this is the osteoblast, which is forming the cell, uh, forming the bone, osteoclast, which is resorting the bone. So what, go, what happens when something goes wrong with your osteoblast signaling, something goes wrong with the TGF signaling which is stimulating the osteoblast to form bone. So what will go wrong? Suppose if in the face 
from increased osteoblastogenesis you will have such thick and dense high bone mass a condition called sclerostosis or similar condition called craniometaphyseal dysplasia so some monogenic factor in the osteoblast can affect your bone mineral density in such a manner in the opposite way if your osteoblastogenesis is affected in your earlier ages you can have condition like juvenile idiopathic osteoporosis what happens when something goes wrong with the osteoblast so a monogenic mute okay sorry osteoblast is known to produce this mineral collagen which is the major scaffold protein compromising of around 90% of your proteinaceous organic material for named collagen especially especially collagen type 1 ava and these are the genetic factors which are responsible for mineralization of this collagen what happens when something goes wrong here in either of these step yes as you all must be thinking we develop a spectrum of disorder of low bone mineral density known as osteogenesis imperfecta i would like to take you to this uh, case vignette of a 3 day old child who presented to us with uh, such major fractures these uh, humerus fractures femur fractures this callus shows that these fractures were probably intrauterine and such major fractures even with the risk probably due to lethal mutation of the spectrum disorder called osteogenesis imperfecta we are glad to say that we have a group of patients um, with such disorder who come on the same day and take the uh, bisphosphonate injections have formed a support group and are support to each other in this lethal condition and are doing well what happens if such genetic disorders also affect this cell which is known to cause the bone resorption so there are there can be enzyme defects or monogenic defects in the cell of osteoblast which can cause diseases for example in the case of decreased osteoblastogenic activity you can have high bone min bone mineral mass like osteopetrosis or in the face of increased osteoblastogenesis you could have uh, diseases with much low bone mineral mass like juvenile pages disease so summarizing that such one mutations have affected our bone mineral density in a very large manner so these are some monogenic disorder examples which have either caused low bone mineral mass or high bone mineral mass but what we are looking at when we look at osteoporosis is that it is probably polygenic that many mutations with such small impact define whether what age i am under i am going to undergo osteoporosis whether i am going to undergo osteoporosis or not right so around 40 50 to 85% of this variance in bone mineral de uh, density is defined by genetic factors the scientists have been able to define such genes which have played a role whether you or me are going to experience osteoporosis and if we are going to osteoporosis experience this then what age either early or late so this polygenic uh, inheritance of osteoporosis has been defined now and probably our therapeutic targets for the same so summarizing these were just monogenic primary disorders which affected our bone health we saw osteogenesis imperfecta this this novel mutation we discovered at uh, our hospital under danlos syndrome uh, which also compromised uh, which also compromised our uh, bone mineral density and platy spondyly was there she has been treated with bisphosphonate injections similar cases like marfan syndrome homocysteinuria pycnodysostosis osteoporosis are known to affect bone mineral density a case of macron albright syndrome or similar polyosteotic fibrous dysplasia so now taking a look at the third cell which was regulating our bone mineral density that is osteocyte taking a closer look at this cell tells us that it it is responsible for producing this hormone sgf23 which is responsible for phosphorus metabolism one known enzyme mutation that is fex g mutation is known to produce a clinical scenario known as known as x-linked hypophosphatemic rickets 
However, other gene mutations can also produce other forms of hypophosphate inhibitors. Let me take you to this case of four-year-old female girl who presented to us with genu alpha. However, what we noted was that the father was also operated for some bony deformities in his adolescence. We found this cupping, splaying, fraying of severe uh, of this severity on her profile. On her mutation testing, the father was confirmed to be a case of X gene mutation. This was the first child. We could prevent this from happening from the in the other sibling. And this is also one of the examples where genetics can influence our future prospective population also. So these were some of the non-modifiable factors affecting our bone health, which we had a look at. Now, let me take you through these modifiable factors, which we can actually control, which we can actually influence, which we can actually uh, take control of. So first of all is nutrition. Let me tell you that both, as, as soon as we hear the word nutrition and both, the first thing that comes to our mind is calcium and vitamin D probably. But let me tell you that both macronutrients as well as micronutrients are equally important uh, for bone health. So as I told you, this bone is made probably 90% protein. And you might be able to gauge now that how important is our protein intake in our diet. During our peak velocity growth ages and pubertal ages, it is recommended to take something around 1.7 to 2 grams per kg per day. But if somebody asks you, which form of protein would you like to take? Animal protein, vegetable protein, if protein is so much important, should we infuse our children with a high protein diet? Is it advisable? So, there is a concept of potential renal acid load. Proteins can also alter our pH and hormonal milieu. That acidic, pro if animal proteins are consumed in much higher amounts, they can have, in fact, negative effect by altering our milieu and producing more acidic, acidic effect and probably inducing osteoplastogenesis as compared to these vegetable proteins which are more basic and probably more osteoblastogenic and hence only adequate amount is recommended. A blend of animal and protein intake is recommended. Supranormal protein intake is to be avoided especially after exercise it should be recommended. So have you wondered ever why this all uh, hype about alkaline water which can induce your bone health? Virat Kohli and other celebrities uh, endorsing this alkaline water. Same goes with the concept of our pH, the protein which can alter our pH milieu, our plasma milieu. And yes, there are proponents of this theory that alkaline water or more basic milieu, maybe probably through this water content, can help you more with osteoblastogenesis and probably prevent the osteoporosis. Equally important is adequate fat intake where essential fatty acids are important. But would you recommend high fat uh, diet consumption then? Definitely not because it can interfere with calcium absorption. When fat is probably more than 45% of our diet, it can reduce calcium absorption to a very large extent. Similarly, simple sugars and the resulting insulin spike is also to be avoided because it can cause increased calcium excretion through the urine and hence detrimental for the bone health. There is no doubt to say that calcium is very, very, very important for our bone health. It has been proven by prospective analysis, uh, retrospective analysis. But what is uh, important is to note that the disorders like VDTRs, where uh, your vitamin D is probably not playing a role. Still, with supranormal, uh, supraphysiological calcium supplementation, you are able to achieve recovery. It is itself a proof of the fact that it's naturally the calcium which is important for mineralization, whereas vitamin D is probably playing an indirect role in increasing the availability of calcium to the bone. There have been so many trials about what those is the preventive adequate dose to prevent a bad bone health. So this is the Indian Academy of Pediatric Guidelines given by Dr. Khadifkar sir, which says that in one to 18 years of age group without high risk, 
something around 600 iu or vitamin d is recommended on a daily basis where something around 600 to 800 mg of calcium is recommended on a daily basis whereas at high risk population at high risk children could be given something around 1000 iu per day and this is as per age so have you ever wondered that the vegetarian people the vegetarian children why dairy products are not so good enough sources of vitamin D and we do recommend them calcium supplementation. So let's have a look at this Amul Taza. This is probably the good pasteurized brand of milk available. Just have a look at the vitamin D content. Sorry. It is just 0 0.5 microgram that equates to 20 I. And here is what we said that we need something around 600 IU per day. Just imagine how many liters of milk you and me will be ending up drinking to compensate that 600 IU need. And hence this um, daily supplementation is advocated. Let's take a look at... Here we are. Then this, there's this calcium uh, supplemented and vitamin D supplemented brands available. But again, the vitamin D there is just 0 0.75 microgram, that is 30 IU. Again, you'll end up drinking some liters of milk daily to be fulfilling your nutritional requirement daily. And hence, daily supplementation is advocated and it is not fulfilled only by consuming dairy products. This is the answer you give to the parents who argue when your, their child drinks two glasses of milk daily. So we saw that nutrition does impact our bone health, both uh, causing low bone health like socioeconomic factors, malabsorption syndromes, vitamin D deficiencies, female athlete triad. They, in fact, it could also cause diseases like high bone mass, like chlorosis, heavy metal poisoning, hypervitaminosis, A and B. This is just one study demonstrating that how uh, bone mineral density is adversely affected in malabsorption syndromes like CDS disease and catching up when treated with adequate gluten-free diet. This is a case we had in our hospital who is uh, showing all the signs of rickets from top to bottom, caput quadrumatum, uh, genovalga, wrist widening. It is disheartening to see such severe grade of rickets only due to nutritional deprivation of calcium and vitamin D. Let's have a look at another modifiable factor that is physical activity. So it was found in prospective analysis that those children who were active in their childhood had something around 8 to 10 percent of more bone mineral content in as young adults and in fact more cross-sectional area when compared to inactive children. So you would definitely want to recommend activity to your children, right? But you'll be questioned which type of activity, how much activity is sufficient. So it has been concluded and given by National Osteoporosis Foundation that almost 20 minutes of vigorous activity, alternate days of a week, maybe three days a week, with five minutes of jumping component, which gives you weight bearing. So weight bearing is very important. For example, if somebody says that my child does swimming, he's a swimmer, that does not add to weight bearing and it does not affect your bone health. So just five minutes of vigorous jumping, three days a week, would be enough as a weight bearing exercise to influence positively your bone health. Similarly, the children with reduced bone mineral, uh, reduced mobility detrimentally affects your bone mineral mass like cerebral palsy, SMAs. So you must be wondering that osteoporosis is an issue of old age. What can a pediatrician do now? Right? But we are like those uh, policy agents where uh, nutrition and uh, exercise are probably the SIPs, which will give us return later in life with good bone mineral density. So we are here, which will influence the capacity to attain this peak bone mass, probably by optimal lifestyle factors, optimal nutrition, optimal exercise. So it's an interplay between nutrition, which we can influence it's an interplay between physical activity and hormonal milieu. So how do hormones affect bone health? 
systemic hormones like estrogen, testosterone, growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, glucocorticoids, all these affect your bone health. But similarly, it has been discovered that even gut hormones, uh, probably linking obesity to bone health, do affect your bone mineral density. So have you also wondered that why adult growth hormone supplementation is advocated in the deficient adult patients? Yes, they have attained their stature. Still, why do we keep recommending that take growth hormone, take growth hormone? They're not going to grow anymore. Still, why do, why do we recommend that? Because it is found, it has been proven that it positively affects your bone mineral density apart from influencing your insulin metabolism. So this is before growth hormone treatment, after growth hormone treatment, where your bone accrual is maintained. So growth hormone positively influences your osteoblastogenesis and promotes remodeling, and hence your bone health is preserved. And hence, it is advocated as a replacement therapy even in adult patients. So which disorders can affect your bone health? Hypogonadism, Growth hormone deficiency. This is my patient. Mind if she is a deficient patient, seven and a half year old. This is a five year old boy. So siblings are a very good comparison for diagnosing growth hormone deficiency. Hyperthyroidism, diabetes mellitus, Cushing syndrome. She is our patient who uh, was diagnosed with Cushing syndrome. This is her before photo, just to show how Cushing syndrome can change your uh, looks. So these were some uh, endocrine disorders which would adversely affect your bone health, like hyperthyroidism causes bone resorption. One very important hormone is parathormone, which works hand in hand with calcium. So what happens with parathormone excess? It stimulates osteocytes, in, increases osteoclastogenesis and hence bone resorption. So let's take a look at this child who came to us in shock, had nephrolithiasis, and genuine. What was more shocking was her biochemistry. Her total serum calcium was 19, which was life threatening and very high alkaline phosphatase in 5000s. This is her skeletal survey. You could appreciate salt and pepper skull uh, deformity here. The resorption from terminal phalanges uh, known as brown tumors and genuine. This is her radionucleotide IV scan, where we diagnosed her with parathyroid adenoma and she was operated for the same. This is how adversely parathyroid excess can affect bone health. Let's have a look at some systemic conditions where our bone health is adversely affected. So there are inflammatory conditions like SLE, tuberculosis, inflammatory bowel diseases, kidney diseases, which I will not even go into, nephrotic syndromes, nephritic syndromes, this whole pathology of CKD and VD, infiltrative diseases like leukemia, thalassemia, so many drugs which are so commonly used like glucocorticoids, anti-epileptics, methotrexates, medroxyprogesterone, all these are known to be adversely affecting bone health. But what is paradoxical is, suppose we are uh, treating tuberculosis, bone is our last driver. So this is what happens that uh, though so many factors, treatment as well the condition itself might be affecting our bone health adversely, it gets lost in the management. It is not uncommon to find the index case when diagnosed with RDA, the whole family is diagnosed with the same condition. Let me show you this uh, DEXA scan of a girl with autoimmune hepatitis who was on chronic steroids and azathioprine. Her uh, preventive DEXA scan was done where uh, the scores were, the Z scores were less than minus 2.7. After being treated with RD amounts of calcium and vitamin D, she was put on solingronate infusions. This is one example of a comprehensive management of a chronic disease where your bone mineral density would be adversely affected. There are so many ways where a systemic disease affects the bone. So immobility that ensues with the chronic disease, the nutrition is compromised, the inflammatory processes itself affect the osteoblast bone formation, hypogonadism, and the glucocorticoids, which are probably part of many chronic diseases, 
So there are so many pathways where your osteoblastogenesis is affected and hence bone mineral density is affected. So we had to look at so many factors which were affecting our bone mineral density. You, you might have also heard this word desert exam in my PPT also many times, but it is the only way to measure our bone mineral density or bone health. No, DEXA can measure your bone mineral density, but what is also important is the micro and macro structural properties of the bones, which give, which defines its health, like bone geometry, microarchitecture, and probably HR, PQCT, that is form of computed tomography. It is a very good means to determine whether your bones are healthy or not, apart from DEXA scan. So we had a look at these modifiable and non-modifiable factors which were affecting our bone health. But so this was all about how our body health was affecting bone health. Has it ever occurred to you whether your bone health is actually affecting your body health? So in the initial uh, slides, I did mention that we have hijacked this organ and we now call it as endocrine organ. So one of the hormones produced is FGF23. It influences our body phosphorus metabolism, our vitamin D metabolism. Another hormone produced is uh, osteocalcin, which promotes our insulin production and our insulin sensitivity. And hence, even bone health, that is healthy bones, can affect our body health. So this osteocalcin is known to influence and um, promote our insulin sensitivity. It is known to be affecting fertility as well apart from memory and learning skills. Another branch of osteoimmunology and lymphopoiesis has opened up after we found that bones can actually affect our immunological system also. So the take away message from my presentation was that yes, we do wonder that it is all about vitamin D when we talk about pediatric bone health, but it's not all about vitamin D. As I wanted to stress that it's an interplay between nutrition, exercise, modifiable and non-modifiable factors. Exercise and nutrition, I believe, should be a part of our prescription writing, apart from taking care of the pathologies. As is always said that prevention is better than cure. So bone health of the whole life, how our whole life is going to be, is determined quite early in life. And we are the ones who will be able to influence it. Last but not the least, body health affects our bone health and bone health affects our body health. So it's important that we keep our bones healthy and strong to be able to maintain our overall health. Thank you. Pediatrics is concerned, uh, you should uh, also give guidelines to promote the you know, health in boys and girls in school. Yes. You have to your PT and all, you know, now everything is online. Yes, definitely. It's <laughs> what will they do? So, a practical aspect of it, knowledge is tremendous, we all know. But to put it into practice so that instead of even from outside the medications and all, why don't we make a use of a sunlight? Why don't we make use of exercise? Why don't we make, make use of the you know the learning process not indoors but outdoors? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for this session? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for this interesting introduction. Next, I would like to welcome uh, Kiran Sade, sir, who is a pediatric uh, nephrologist at uh, Sir H. N. Reliance Hospital. Uh, sir would like to speak about the approach uh, for a child who is presenting with the features of rickets. Sir.
So sorry for the delay. We are having in hybrid uh, presentation. So there are a few members who have connected online as well as the physical meeting, which is uh, being held here. So uh, coming to the topic approach to rickets in children, we just heard from Dr. Purvi the different determinants of bone health in children and the different disorders that come under the spectrum of metabolic bone disease. So as we realize that the metabolic bone disease spectrum is quite a large spectrum and there could be different disorders which may present with similar presentation. And one has to be very sure about what diagnosis the child has so as to give an effective treatment and to ensure a better outcome. And so as we can see here, there are different children uh, being shown here. All of them have some kind of a metabolic bone disease and they all presented with similar presentations initially, like a delayed walking, inability to run or walk fast, unlike other children of their age, bony deformities. And in fact, one child, the third child also has suffered multiple fractures just in the initial few years of life, just by the starting in the neonatal period, uh, there were multiple recurrent fractures and uh, he has become like a crippled, you know, always in the calipers. And so this has definitely affected their childhood. And it also threatens to affect their adult life as they grow. So uh, there are several disorders that we need to, you know, we may encounter and we need to be sure what we are dealing with. So as we know that strong structure definitely needs a strong foundation. And this, as we could uh, see from the previous uh, session, it uh, is very important for children because they have the entire life in front of them. And hence, an adequate bone mass and good bone health is very important. When we talk about the different conditions that affect the uh, pediatric bones and the bone diseases, we uh, think of two major terms like osteoporosis and osteomalacia. And although they appear synonymous, there is a distinct difference between the two. To put it simply, osteoporosis is a normal bone composition, but reduced in quantity, which we find usually in the older, older people uh, who are you know, elderly po population. And that is uh, the type when we find, find the osteoporosis. But as Dr. Purvi said, that there could be certain conditions where even children may be uh, having severe osteoporosis. So the bone composition is good or it is normal, but the bone density is reduced. Whereas in osteomalacia or rickets, the bone mineralization is affected, whereas the overall anatomy or the structure may be normal. So this bone is a weak bone and because it is inadequately mineralized and as a result, it uh, has less strength. So when we talk about rickets or osteomalacia in children, it basically refers to the actively growing part of the bone, which is the growth plate, which is at the junction of the metaphysis and the epiphysis. And this is the site where this pathology begins and it affects the overall bone structure. So what happens exactly in rickets, as we can appreciate here, that uh, this, this is the site, which is the growth plate and which has been magnified here. And there are different cartilage cells in different stages of development. And in a child who has adequate mineralization, that means adequate level of calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, these cartilage cells will get terminally differentiated in presence of adequate calcium, vitamin D, and they will get incorporated into the bone cells. And this is how the bones will start elongating and uh, they will become strong. But when there is inadequate calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, this process of terminal differentiation of the cartilage cells into bone cells is getting affected. And it is not going as per the expected normal process. And due to this, the bone will not get adequately mineralized and there will be an excess of unmineralized matrix. The other important thing that happens in the normal health is that in presence of adequate uh, calcium and especially phosphorus, the unmineralized cartilage, the whatever cartilage is not getting mineralized, it gets reabsorbed or undergoes a natural cell death called apoptosis. So this is a process which ensures that there is no excess of weak cartilage which is not uh, mineralized and the bone structure remains healthy. But when we have uh, rickets or you know, hypophosphatemia, phosphate deficiency per se, this process does not go as expected and as a result we would find more of in unmineralized cartilage cells which are getting accumulated in these metafascial regions or the growing ends of the bones and as a result of which they give rise to certain uh, pictures which are uh, suggestive of rickets. So for instance, as we can appreciate here, this uh, wrist widening, which uh, is seen on the X-ray in the form of metapartial flaring, splaying and cupping is basically resulting from this excess of unmineralized cartilage, which is getting accumulated here. And this has been found that it's basically, phosphate is an important ion, which is responsible for this kind of a disorder. If the phosphate is deficient, these children will be developing such deformities in the uh, growing bones. 
Fine. So before we start treating all the children with the diagnosis of rickets, we have to be very careful because there could be certain conditions which may appear to be like rickets but may not be rickets. For instance, a child who has a short limbs a dwarfism, a disproportionate body stature, may be very well a case of skeletal dysplasia. And only when you do an X-ray, you would find that although it looks like rickets, it is not a rickets. So it may be totally a different condition that you may be dealing with. And if you do not do the X-ray or the biochemical testing, you may be you know giving uh, unnecessary vitamin D calcium to such children, and uh, it may lead to toxicity. Or the other case scenario, like the child which we described, a um, child who comes with recurrent fractures, and we may be tempted to call this as you know poor bone mineral density resulting from rickets. But there may be some telltale evidence in the form of a blue sclera, and this may turn out to be a case of osteogenesis imperfecta. This is actually, these are all cases which are currently following with us, and they are real cases. And this child basically has got sustained multiple fractures, and we could appreciate on the x-ray that there are, you know, uh, uh, places where the bone has got tried to heal. So all these places would be seen on the x-rays. Or the other close mimic of rickets could be a scurvy uh, condition that we commonly encounter in severely malnourished children, where because of vitamin C deficiency, they may present with pictures similar to rickets. So the uh, rib PD or the rachitic rosary may appear similar to the scorbutic rosary and we may be tempted to you know, label this as rickets and start on vitamin D, whereas it may be basically a severe vitamin C deficiency. So unless we do an X-ray and see this typical penciling of the cortex, we may not be able to say that this is you know, rickets or scurvy. The child may present similarly with inability to bear weight and you know, uh, kind of a deformity of the limb, the limb is because of the bleeding into the periosteal regions. So as we see that the diagnosis of rickets has to be made on clinical grounds, but has to be supplemented by doing a biochemical testing, do a basic biochemical workup to ensure that there is a calcium deficiency, phosphate deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, high alkaline phosphatase or hyperparathyroidism, and supplementing with that a radiological confirmation. So if you have all these things in place, then you may be safe to label this child as a rickets, and then you can start on the appropriate line of management. Broadly, we identified two major groups of rickets. So this is again a histor histological, uh, historical classification. Uh, we group them either as a calcipenic rickets where there is a predominant calcium deficiency, or it may be a phosphopenic rickets where there is a phosphate deficiency. So there are different conditions which may be grouped under these two broad headings. In calcipenic rickets, we may be dealing with the nutritional rickets where there is a nutritional vitamin D deficiency, which may be resulting from several other conditions like a dietary deficiency, or a child with malabsorption like a celiac disease, which Dr. Kurvi mentioned. Lack of inadequate sunlight exposure for people who are uh, staying at high altitudes uh, or certain you know, cultural norms where children are deprived of the adequate uh, sunlight. Or there could be a defect in 25 hydroxylation of the vitamin D uh, due to certain liver disease or certain medications like anticonvulsants, which hampers the inadequate the conversion of cholecal the cholecalciferoid to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Or there could be further down defect in the form of you know, renal defect where the 1-alpha hydroxylation is not occurring. And this could be seen with kidney defects, the kidney diseases, um, or it could be kind of a resistance to the vitamin D receptor. We all know that vitamin D now functions via a receptor called vitamin D receptor. And if this receptor is resistant to the effects of vitamin D, the children may have supranormal levels of vitamin D, but it will not be effective. So this is another rare kind of a, a vitamin D dependent or you could call it as a resistant rickets where the child may present with severe deformities. In one of the child cases that we will be discussing, they will find this case. It could be even a calcium deficiency, which nowadays one may not think the child may be calcium deficient because usually these children are on supplemental calcium right from very early age. But that could also be a, a condition that one may encounter. Or a renal rickets, very rarely you may even find a child with chronic renal failure or a chronic kidney disease who may present with renal osteodystrophy and may present similar to a condition with rickets. Right? So there are different things which may appear same, but may be totally different. As against this, there is another category called phosphopenic rickets, where you have a phosphate deficiency, which could result from phosphate wasting in the kidneys, in the urine. And there are other different conditions. It could be a proximal or a, a total tubular defect in the form of a Fanconi syndrome, where in addition to phosphate, certain other substrates are also getting lost. Or it could be a kind of a uh, condition where there is an active phosphate wasting. Dr. Purvi mentioned something called as FGF23, which is a, like a hormone which causes phosphate wasting. 
so there are certain conditions like extreme hypophosphatemic rickets and other related conditions which may present as a primary phosphate wasting and resulting into rickets so this this is a historical uh, historical classification and uh, this is a normal vitamin d metabolism which we all know that whatever vitamin d we consume maybe from the natural diet or the medications or from the sunlight exposure the first important step is in the liver where there is 25 hydroxylation occurring and then this subsequently the kidney gets converted to the activated vitamin d or the calcitriol and this is basically the active form of vitamin d which brings about all the essential uh, chemical reactions and to ensure that there is an adequate amount of calcium in the body right so with uh, calcitriol acts along with pth to ensure that all the homeostasis is maintained now beyond the, so this is the skeletal part of vitamin d that we are all aware of but now there have been enough evidence to say that there are non classic lipids of vitamin d which are mediated through vitamin d receptors so it is not just important for the bones and the skeletal health that vitamin d is required in fact now there is ample amount of evidence to suggest that vitamin d may have a role in many of the other conditions affecting the uh, our uh, children and for example vitamin d has been implicated in autoimmunity so if you have adequate amounts of vitamin d one may be avoiding certain kinds of autoimmune diseases anti inflammatory effect of vitamin d is also evident so to prevent so anti carcinogenesis effect anti you uh, know atherosclerotic effect so there are different non classical effects of vitamin d which have been now found and which are important to be considered so your vitamin d is not only just important for the bones but also for preventing all these other uh, problems from occurring so what happens when we are deficient in vitamin d when we are deficient in vitamin d naturally the calcium will start falling the calcium phosphorus so the body will initially try to compensate by producing uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism and this hyperparathyroidism as we can see here starts rising and initially tries to maintain the calcium within the normal limits but if the deficiency of vitamin d goes unchecked and if it continues then at certain point of time it is going to keep dropping further whereas this pth will keep rising further so this is a vicious cycle of hyperparathyroidism and a continued hypocalcemia hypophosphatemia and prolonged vitamin d deficiency so this is uh, the biochemical effects that we encounter in children who have vitamin d deficiency now traditionally uh, this is the reason why the uh, there are different cutoffs which are now established to what to call as a vitamin d deficiency or vitamin d normalcy so this is basically based on what level will elicit a secondary hyperparathyroidism so at below what level the pth will start rising and different studies have said that 30 nanograms per ml could be a safe target to say that if your vitamin d levels are about 30 uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin d levels are about 30 then you may be deficient um, normal in vitamin d stores and if it is below that then you may be actually deficient in vitamin d this is basically because it is causing elicitation of the hyperparathyroidism so to keep your vitamin d within normal levels you have to achieve a, a golden figure of 30 nanograms per ml as we know that um, calcium and phosphate homeostasis is maintained by pth and vitamin d it is also important to note that when we are dealing with children who have calcium or phosphate deficiency there are different norms uh, depending on what age the child belongs to the levels will vary and when we are treating these children it is important to be aware of these normal variations in the vitamin the calcium and the phosphate levels and accordingly to treat them so as to bring them into these normal age groups so now we know that uh, phosphate is an important ion to prevent uh, rickets from happening to ensure that there is a normal apoptosis happening of the unmineralized cartilage and when there is a phosphate deficiency it can cause these changes of rickets there are different determinants pth calcitriol and fgf and this fgf 23 is now a new hormone which has been found to be acting in many of these conditions what it can cause is it can actively cause deficiency of the calcitriol and thereby causing less phosphate absorption causing phosphate deficiency or on the other hand in certain conditions it can actively cause phosphate wasting so that there may be phosphate wasting from the urine and the kidneys and this could also be resulting in these conditions like hypophosphatemic rickets so phosphate is a very important ion and it is not only calcium but phosphate which is also important so now the big, uh, current classification of rickets is basically there is a uh, the common uh, thing that happens is the hypophosphatemia in calcipenic as well as phosphopenic rickets and depending on what is the type of uh, uh, rickets you may be dealing with calcium deficiency rickets or a phosphate wasting or a secondary phosphate loss in cases of pancreas syndrome so it may be any of these conditions but the bottom line would be a common phosphate deficiency 
Fine. So we all are aware of the presenting features that these children with rickets usually present. These are the common classical findings, wrist widening, extreme deformities. This is a child who presented to us with vitamin D dependent rickets type 2 with alopecia, which uh, is a kind of a end organ resistance to vitamin D receptor. So no matter how much vitamin you give, vitamin D you give, it is not going to be effective. And these have a very uh, like a morbid presentation, severe deformities. Uh, so this could be the other classical presentation, like a bleeding of the ribs, which is classically known, and wrist widening. Rare presentations could be in the form of alopecia, which this child has uh, vitamin D dependent rickets presenting with alopecia. And why do, do these children have alopecia? Is that the vitamin D receptor, which is the key uh, area where the problem arises, is also deficient in the bones as well as in the hair follicles. And as a result, this is usually uh, uh, like a telltale evidence of a vitamin D dependent rickets type 2. And those children who respond to high doses of vitamin D also start showing some improvement in the hair follicles and this may be an indirect evidence that you know the vitamin D is started acting. Rarely these children may also present with dental abscesses or you know, dental problems in the form of enamel hypoplasia and in addition to the bones we may also have to pay attention to the teeth because this could be an attendant problem in these children with rickets. So it may present with variety of deformities like a bow legs, windswept deformity or knock knees. Rarely Vitamin D deficiency has been associated with premature fusion of the sutures and causes you know, such a condition called craniosynostosis. And they may present with abnormal shape of the head called as a dolicocephaly. And it may also be sometimes presenting with uh, raised intracranial pressure and a chiari, Arnold chiari type of a malformation. So one may encounter such rare instances where the child may be having rickets and rickets is causing these problems. So this could be a rare instance that you may encounter or even a rare association of a girl who has got these kind of a skin lesions, Levi, comes with precocious puberty and has severe vitamin D deficiency. So this could be a case of a fibrous dysplasia, like a McKeown Albright syndrome, where this uh, child may present with severe vitamin D deficiency. So as we see that the vitamin D deficiency may be you know, silently present in different conditions, which we may not be suspecting to be having rickets. So uh, it's important to treat the vitamin D deficiency in such children. Who may be having these problems. Another rare association could be a child who has a kidney stones or a nephrocalcinosis, which may be associated with certain types of rickets, for instance, the distal renal tubular acidosis, who may be having nephrocalcinosis as a part and parcel of the disorder, or a child who comes with severe cardiac failure, maybe having a dilated cardiomyopathy resulting from a severe hypocalcemia, resulting from severe vitamin D deficiency. So the spectrum of vitamin D deficiency can you know, range from the normal known features to something which is atypical and lesser known. If we have the calcipenic rickets or phospopenic rickets, there are certain differentiating points on the history that you may uh, be able to identify. For instance, calcipenic rickets will usually have a lot of muscle weakness, so hypotonia, delayed walking. So this will be common with calcipenic rickets. Bone pains will be more common with calcipenic rickets. And, uh, like a florid picture of rickets usually seen in calcipenic rickets but if it is a phospopenic rickets for some specific reason the lower limbs are predominantly affected and the reason what has been mentioned is that the phosphate deficiency predominantly affects the most active parts of the growth and usually these are the lower bones the lower limbs long bones which are predominantly affected uh, cal hypocalcemia resulting from calcipenic rickets may present with titani there may be an enamel hypoplasia Dental abscesses may be more frequent with phosphopenic rickets and uh, parathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism will be starkingly seen with hypocalcemia or calcipenic rickets, whereas it will be normal or minimally elevated in case of phosphopenic rickets. So there are certain differentiating features which may be able to you know, come on the physical examination and history. So after this, we'll see some typical cases of rickets, uh, which you must have also seen in your uh, OPD practice. So this is a first case, a typical scenario of an eight-year-old boy who presented with uh, symptoms of inability to run and walk fast, knock knees, which was noticed by the around age of around three years. And uh, he was initially put on some vitamin D and calcium supplements, but was not compliant. And as we can appreciate here, little dark complexion. So maybe that could be the reason why he had a nutritional vitamin D deficiency. And uh, here, when we did his biochemistry, he had a normal serum calcium, normal phosphorus. There was increased alkaline phosphatase, normal creatinine, normal bicarbonate. We would come to know why is these parameters important to be done 
in such older children who present with rickets because it could be certain atypical presentations where you may be required to do certain additional tests to confirm that this is just a nutritional rickets or something else so the to cut the story short this child basically had a nutritional vitamin d deficiency in the form of low serum 25 hydroxy vitamin d and high phosphorus and then he was it was uh, uh, told to the parents that we have to be compliant with the medications in order to make sure that the child starts showing improvement and after uh, reassuring and giving them uh, adequate advice the parents complied with the uh, therapy and the child improved with the dose of vitamin d which was given for 10 weeks like a 60000 units and after this uh, 8 to 12 weeks later when we repeated the x-ray the x-ray showed improvement and the nocles also started improving and now the child is symptomatically better so this is a case of a nutritional typical vitamin d deficiency rickets so usually to confirm that the rickets is healing it has been advised that you do a x-ray 6 uh, to 8 weeks later and if you can identify the white line of healing then you can say that the rickets has started improving so this could be a typical situation of a nutritional rickets as against this this is another 10 year old boy who presented with history of knock knees since 4 years of age this is a case of dr ruchi uh, who came with poor growth polydipsia polyuria and uh, this was the presentation when he initially presented in the infancy had hepatomegaly and uh, biochemistry was suggestive of a very low serum phosphate normal calcium high serum alkaline phosphate is normal 25 hydroxy vitamin d so here unlike the first case this child had a normal vitamin d levels a uh, very low serum phosphate and the normal calcium normal creatinine he had uh, evidence of metabolic acidosis and there was glycosuria proteinuria and hypercalciuria so this child is different from the first child and he has lot of atypical features which are not seen in the typical nutritional vitamin d deficiency so any guesses what could this be a situation of pancreas pancreas right and any uh, uh, etiology specific that you would think of it is a pancreas yeah so there are different conditions which can produce pancreas especially when you have a hepatomegaly and rickets hepatorenal presentation there are only two or three conditions which may give rise to this kind of a presentation so one is tyrosinemia other is wilson's disease so both can present with pro proximal renal tubular acidosis or pancreas syndrome and can present with a renal rickets right so hepatorenal presentation is what this child had and to cut the story short this child underwent a kidney bio uh, liver biopsy and genetic testing confirmed that this was a tyrosinemia and recently the child has undergone uh, he has got a liver transplantation and is doing well so the reason why this child develops all these features is that when you have a tyrosinemia which is a metabolic disorder the metabolites which start accumulating can have different side effects in the form of liver damage renal tubular damage and hence just by replacing the deficient uh, you know uh, enzymes you may be able to salvage these children and reverse most of the comorbidities from developing this is another third case uh, uh, case which is recently following with us a 5 year old girl who presented with severe progressive bony deformity starting from infancy multiple fractures and she does not have polyuria polydipsia but has a suboptimal growth and has a total alopecia since birth fine right? so you can appreciate there are no eyebrows no hair follicles anywhere on the body she has a normal calcium low phosphorus high alkaline phosphate is striking thing is that she has a very high 125 hydroxy vitamin d which tells you that this is probably a receptor defect or a vitamin d receptor defect where no matter how much high calcium or vitamin d you give it's not going to be effective she again has a normal creatinine and a normal tmp gfr which is a test that we do to confirm whether the child has phosphate wasting phosphate urea or no this child has a normal renal ultrasound and x ray suggests severe osteoporosis and rickets so this child basically we did a genetics and it confirmed that there is a vitamin d receptor uh, mutation and this confirms that this child has a vitamin d dependent rickets type 2 with alopecia this child required iv calcium initially because of, there was severe hypocalcemia ionic calcium was very low although she did not have titani but it was quite low she this child, the way to treat this children has been a very high dose of calcitriol so if you can appreciate 1 to 6 micrograms per kg per day which translates into roughly 60 capsules of calcitriol that this child is consuming 0.25 to microgram capsule around 60 capsules is this child consuming every day calcium supplements also important thing to note is that all these rickets when you see it's not just straight forward calcium or vitamin d deficiency many of these may be also having some kind of a tubular problems and when you evaluate them in detail uh, studies have said that up to 40% of these children may have some kind of an acidification defect 
and you may need a small amount of alkali to supplement to ensure that the healing of the rickets progresses in a better way so otherwise if you just give calcium vitamin d and if you do not supplement this uh, potassium citrate or the alkali then the healing may not be as good as it should have happened this child also required zoledronic acid which is like a base phosphonate because the child had a severe osteoporosis on the dexa scan and fractures this is another uh, interesting case who regularly follows in our opd a 7 year old boy who came with knock knees as the initial presentation recurrent respiratory infections cough cold and occasionally requiring some hospitalization for that poor growth and nocturia so again there are certain features which are common with the uh, case of rta the nocturia and poor growth so again this child had a low calcium low phosphorus high alkaline phosphatase normal creatinine so there was a hyperchloremic normal gap and an acidosis hypercalciuria and there was a other test so suggest that there was some problem with the urinary acid depletion so urinary anemia was positive this child also had nephrocalcinosis and the eyes were normal so any cases what could this be is this similar to the second case that we saw yeah so this is also a case of rta but in addition to hypercalciuria there is nothing else to suggest proximal so this child is basically case of a distal renal tubular acidosis um, so this child basically requires a treatment with potassium citrate which is given to prevent the renal stones from developing because they have a tendency to develop renal stones and nephrocalcinosis and this is this nephrocalcinosis which can cause renal failure later in life so these children require aggressive monitoring and treatment and if there is hypercalciuria there could be certain other medications which could be given to reduce the hypercalciuria and formation of nephrocalcinosis so this is a case of a distal rt yeah so this is another uh, quite an unfortunate case as i think uh, it could be evident from the history that uh, a 10 year old boy who presented antenatally with oligohydramnios and had acute kidney injury immediately in the neonatal age after birth had a high creatinine oligonuria and required peritoneal dialysis for acute renal failure so after that uh, he kind of improved and stabilized and he was evaluated and he was found to have posterior urethral valves so which were fulgurated and later on because he had bladder issues he was put on cic so he was continued to be all right but not completely okay but he had suboptimal growth he had some kind of abnormal limbs as you can appreciate the limbs are quite deformed they are not normal and uh, he had these deformities which kept on worsening he also developed hypertension also was found to be anemic so what could be this uh, phenotype what that we are dealing with any guesses yeah so as we can see in the biochemistry he had a low calcium high phosphorus so this is something that is quite opposite to the first four cases that we saw who always usually presented with hypophosphatemia so any child who has a high serum phosphorus with rickets uh, you should be alerted that this could be possibly a renal failure situation or a chronic kidney disease which this child has so uh, basically a pu valve which is causing a late damage in the form of a chronic kidney disease or uh, presenting with high pth and high creatinine so uh, creatinine is 5.2 so this is basically a case of a chronic kidney disease resulting from the uh, posterior urethral valves and this is quite an unfortunate story in today's age that uh, the child has come to a ckd so this child requires multidisciplinary way of management in the uh, in the form of phosphate binders which are to prevent the hyperphosphatemia supplementing calcium cholate calciferol calcitriol to supplement to improve his anemia oral iron erythropoietin to control his hypertension anti hypertensives and oral soda bicarbonate which is to prevent or to control the acidosis so this is a case of a chronic kidney disease presenting as a rickets which is basically a renal osteodystrophy or a mineral bone disease so this is to just summarize that when you have rickets it may be any of these conditions and you have to pay close attention to the biochemical profile and to identify what is the abnormal parameter and then come to a, a appropriate diagnosis so we saw from the cases that it may not be a nutritional rickets all the while and there could be certain pointers which may tell you that this could be a non nutritional rickets so instance a child who older child who presents with severe poor growth could be a very well a case of nutrition non nutritional rickets or a, you know older children presenting with short stature severe rickets which are not responding to your nutritional uh, vitamin d supplements or calcium supplements child coming with polyuria polydipsia anemia high creatinine metabolic acidosis hyperphosphatemia again have to be thought of whether they have non -nut non nutritional rickets consanguinity cataracts which could be suggestive of some tubular problem or metabolic problem like a lowes syndrome or you know uh, galactosemia 
causing renal tubular acidosis. Cognitive defects, where you have dense disease or Lewis syndrome, which could be having some of these problems. Hepatorenal presentation, as we saw in the tyrosinemia or Wilson's. Renal stones, nephrocalcinosis, and malabsorption. So these are the pointers when we sit in the OPD and if we find any child with rickets, this should be the pointers that should run through our mind to identify whether these could be uh, any of these conditions. So it's important to do the complete workup at least once before you start the treatment so that you don't miss out these conditions. So calcium, phosphorus, maybe bicarbonate, creatinine, very, very important not to miss chronic kidney disease or a renal failure situation. And uh, so that will be very important. Alkaline phosphate is Maybe all these tests may not be important in each and every case, but at least creatinine, bicarbonate, you know, and depending on what kind of a phenotype that you're dealing with. You may do a PTH initially because your hypophosphatemia may not have that high hyperparathyroidism as expected in uh, calcipenic rickets. And then depending on the other uh, evidence, you may do some other, other tests to look for renal tubular function in the form of urinary pH, urinary electrolytes, anion gap, and uh, ultrasound look for the eyes and then accordingly you may be able to come to a reasonable diagnosis. So what is the approach just to simplify whenever you have rickets, you first, uh, so if you, you may first do a vitamin D, 25 hydroxy vitamin D level and uh, may come to a uh, uh, one of the uh, directions whether it is a vitamin D deficiency and then you may do a serum PTH level if it is low. Um, if it is elevated, you may be doing, dealing with one of these conditions which are typically associated. And if it is low, it may be a, a condition where it may be a vitamin D dependent rickets type 1, type 2. If it is a hypophosphatemic rickets, then it may be either a, a isolated tubular defect or it may be a part of a proximal renal tubular acidosis like pantenin. And then you may be able to come to a reasonable diagnosis. Having said that, if, we, if it is a nutritional rickets, there are different ways of treating and then the recent Guidelines suggest that either you could put them on a daily dose of vitamin D, which could be in the form of a 2000 units or vitamin D, and then you monitor them periodically, or you may give a mega doses, but make sure that you monitor them at certain levels so as to not cause hypervitaminosis D or hypercalciuria. And if it is a non nutritional rickets, depending on what is the condition, you may require different type of a management. If it is a vitamin D dependent rickets, a very high dose of vitamin D hypophosphatemic rickets, phosphate supplementations with or without vitamin D, renal tubular acidosis, as we saw, alkali plus vitamin D plus phosphate, CKD may require all these things, phosphate binders, vitamin D, alkali, and if it is not helping, then a renal replacement therapy in the form of a dialysis or a transplantation. And corrective surgery has to be ensured only after you have achieved a biochemical uh, normalcy, and uh, this is the only time when you can think of, when you can refer them to the orthopedic surgeons for corrective surgery. So just to summarize, whenever you have rickets, and it's not very clear. So whenever you have rickets, try to see for factors that could raise possibility of non-nutritional rickets in the different things that we just saw in the previous slide. Family clustering, CKD, chronic liver disease, malabsorption, alopecia, cataracts, failure to thrive. And if there are none of these factors, then you could be dealing with nutritional rickets, which then you may supplement with vitamin D, and then you may see for improvement in the symptoms. And if it is not the case, then you may be dealing with a non-nutritional rickets. And then depending on the diagnosis, you may require appropriate therapy. Right. So just to take home message, rickets needs appropriate uh, clinical, biochemical, and X-ray diagnosis. Proper workup is important. Should be able to identify which are the non-nutritional cases. Uh, do creatinine because that is an important test in every case. I think it's not going to cost you much, but it will save you the uh, unfortunate uh, child presenting with renal failure later. Avoid giving mega doses without monitoring because it can cause problems. And wherever possible, if you have atypical presentation, genetic testing would be advisable to confirm the diagnosis. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can take it later. If you have any questions, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have uh, Ruchi Parikh, ma'am, who is a consultant pediatric endocrinologist at Sir Edwin Leland Hospital. Uh, she'll be discussing about the child who presents with recurrent fractures and the uh, role of bisphosphonate in these cases.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, after the basic bone health by Dr. Purvi and uh, from calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphorus, and vitamin D, let's go to bone mineral density. Um, so, recurrent fractures in children is the topic, but we also need to understand that certain children may not present with fractures. So, it's not just about fractures, but it's about bone fragility. So, to just to understand that during growth, the bone undergoes a process of modeling whereby the length, lengthening bone increases in width and cortical thickness. So this is very important for any bone to grow in a growing child. The strength of a bone is determined by the modeling process, which is the size and the shape of the bone, and the bone's mineral density and the material properties. So the material properties has been emphasized by Dr. Kiran, and also it's the other property like collagen that we need to understand through this session. So the bone mass, the bone development and bone strength is basically determined genetically in 80% of children. But the rest of the uh, part is not genetically determined. So it's muscle mass, which plays a role in 15%. And besides that, it's the calcium intake, it's the serum vitamin D intake, or it's the exposure that you have in the dietary process and the sunlight exposure, along with the pubertal hormones, which plays a role of 5% in the bone mass development and strength. So once the uh, physical activity, pubertal progression, adequate dietary calcium intake, and vitamin D RDA is in, the bone mineral density of any normal child is maintained. So this is what happens in a normal child. But we need to see what happens in a child who has bone fragility or an abnormal of the uh, bone mineral density. So in children up, up to 18 years of age, 50% of boys and approximately 40% of girls do sustain a fracture in childhood, which all of you already know. Okay, and the common site is distal radius. Okay, and the peak incidence in boys is between 13 to 14 years and in girls is between 11 to 12 years. This is because there is increase in the growth spurt. We all know that the growth spurt happens around this age group in the respective genders. Also, there is increase in the physical activity or the movement that the child is exposed to. And why distal radius? Because it has the decreased cortical strength at this site at this age group. So up to 15 to 20 percent of children do suffer more than two fractures by this age, and only small proportion from this actually have problems of underlying bone fragility or osteoporosis. So it is very important to know that whether this is a high impact traumatic fracture or one that is resulting from an increased bone fragility, which is after a trivial trauma. So a trauma which you and me can undergo will, but will, will not have any fracture. So if there is compression of the vertebra and causing vertebral fractures, then it is important. Also, if there's a low impact fracture, so that means just by walking or by changing diapers in infancy, you, you cause a fracture to a child that's called a low impact fracture. And there's spontaneous femoral fracture. So without any, any trauma, with any inciting insult, there is uh, spontaneous femoral fractures, then this will be this will be because of some underlying mineralization problem, which is osteoporosis. So for any management of osteoporosis or bone mineral density, it requires a multidisciplinary team to address it. As mentioned in the first session, physical activity, nutrition in all forms is important. Puberty plays a very important role. So timely induction or timely puberty happening and its progression is equally important. And the management of any underlying medical condition, pharmacotherapy, and even the intervention by the orthopedic at the right time. So the childhood conditions which can cause bone fragility are two kinds. One is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a low bone mass. So what happens in osteoporosis is there is an augmented osteoclast activity which causes the decreased bone mass because of osteolysis and this increases the fracture risk. So the primary or the inherited or the genetic osteoporotic conditions in children most common is osteogenesis imperfecta and the less than that is the idiopathic juvenile osteoporosis, Allodano syndrome which has already been shown by Dr. Kuri and osteoporosis telogramma syndrome. 
what is more common is not these inherited disorders, but the secondary uh, causes, which is because of the underlying disorders. So we all know as pediatricians and all of these super speciality people that there are certain conditions which are chronic. So these chronic conditions can affect the bone health, as is always already mentioned by Dr. Kuti, that when these conditions happen, the least important is bone health. So that's why these children have problems with mobility and even with you know maintaining their bone mineral density. So what are these conditions? So these are the conditions which are associated with inflammation. So we all know about SLE, we know about IED and GIA. So we know what happens to these children in these conditions. We also know what kind of drugs they go through and also how much of immobility that they have. Okay, so nowadays obviously the calcium and vitamin D supplementation is ongoing, but that's not the end of the whole bone mineral pro program. We also need to make sure that there are therapists involved to make sure the mobility is in place. Poor nutrition, we know adolescents. I mean, in these two years, we've seen a lot of adolescents going through anorexia, nervosa, bulimia. So there's a lot of nutritional issues because of the psychological disorders, which again becomes chronic. So these needs to be addressed along with their timely intervention of puberty and bone health. But the other conditions which can cause poor, uh, poor nutrition is your uh, celiac disease, malabsorption, and parental nutrition, which is probably a condition which has to lead with GI. So long-term high-dose oral glucocorticoids, we all know, can affect the bone health, can also affect the stature, can affect the growth base. And this is seen in, in, in conditions where there is also muscle weakness and immobility, for example, like TMD for children who are undergoing a treatment for leukemia and cystic fibrosis. So there is multi multiple factors which will affect their bone mineral health. With reduced mobility, it's cerebral palsy or it's any spinal cord injury or the tissue muscle muscular dystrophy. Uh, in renal disorders, as is also being shown by Dr. Kiran in his last session, that these uh, chronic metabolic acidosis or renal failure would require a bone mineral density uh, treatment like uh, so renal shown there. We cannot forget the hematological disorder, especially thalassemia, where again the children are undergoing a lot of blood transfusion. They have to also be given treatment for chelation. They have an uh, affection of mobility and hence bone mineral health. So it's very important to identify the bone mineral density in these children in the earlier stage so that they, we can save them from a lot of deformities because even the drugs which cause chelation are. Uh, possible for the deformities in this gene. Endocrine conditions. Uh, obviously, as an endocrinologist, endocrine conditions too, and all the hormones as already mentioned, they are very important to role uh, in the bone health. And it's not just the deficiency, because if you see, obviously, the pubertal uh, delay, or if there is anything to do with the growth hormone deficiency, there will be affection of the bones. But there's also excess secretion, for example, macrin, where there's hyperthyroidism. Okay, or where there is pushing, so there's again excess of the cortisol. So, how we see an oral glucocorticoid exposure, we also see it in pushing that it can affect the bone health. And same syndromes like Turner syndrome and Lyme disorder. Osteopenia of prematurity, which is obviously seen in the newborns and premature conditions. Most of the time, they will not probably need any of the support for bone mineral density or bone mineral health. Uh, but if they, there are certain kids who do have moderate to severe osteoporosis, then they would need the discosphenes. So osteopenia of the maturity is just also not about supplementing with calcium and vitamin D. So we saw about low bone mass. Now going to the next, which is high bone mass. So why would there be a fracture even there's a high bone mass? So what happens over there? There is increased uh, rate of fracture because of the abnormal bone micro uh, architecture, which leads to decreased bone strength. So all these children, whether it is osteoporosis or with the high bone mass, it's about the cortical strength. It is about the cortical width, which is affected, and hence they have suffered from fragility and fractures. So osteopetrosis already been mentioned in the first session, and pigmentous osteoporosis are the conditions which can cause fracture. So this is the uh, uh, diagnostic statement for pediatric osteoporosis. Obviously, it's kind of covered with that uh, zoom in, but it is this is how pediatric osteoporosis is defined. Okay, so finding one or more vertebral compression fractures. So vertebra is a very important uh, bone in the in the child. And if there is any compression fracture in the absence of any disease or trauma, it should be given an importance. Also, we would be looking into the DEXA scan as already been mentioned to know the bone mineral density. But if there is no crush fracture, so if there is no vertebral compression, 
then the diagnosis is based on a clinically uh, significant fracture. So we can't just say because this child has had a fracture, so everyone would require this for schools. So it's a clinically significant fracture with a bone mineral density where the red stone is less than two, which is seen on the DEXA scan. Now it is very important how you interpret the DEXA scan because DEXA scan has needs to have all these things in, in, in place. So for example, sorry. Okay, you're looking at the total body minus the head. You're looking at the number spine, and it has to be interpreted for the reference range of that ethnicity, for their gender, for their chronological age, for the height, for the height age, and the scale of SMR. So, these are all the conditions that a DEXA scan interpreter needs to take into consideration. So, now what is clinically significant fracture? So, any of the long bones which fracture before two years of age and are more than two, they are significant. Or if up to 19 years and more than three or more long, long bones which have Fracture. The uh, trauma could be anything, it could be a lower back or a high back, but it's the number of fractures within this age group of the long bone which will be significant. So, just treating a DEXA scan with a poor Z score will not be the indication for pediatric osteoporosis. That's the take home uh, from this statement. So, now children with recurrent fractures, as I said, would have still a normal DEXA scan, but there would be an excessive force, or there would be a low force, but they would have a reduced bone strength, and hence they would have multiple fractures. So, whom can you exclude easily? Otherwise, you have a road traffic accident, so a high trauma, or a fall from about three feet. So, if this is the kind of trauma that the child has sustained, and probably this is once in a lifetime, this is not going to lead to osteoporosis. This is one event. But it is very unclear when it when we look, look at the infant and older child, because obviously they are not moving that much, they are not uh, follow up, and they don't even have so much of sports. So it, it may be confusing in such age groups. So it is important to understand that how these children have undergone an antenatal and postnatal course to differentiate between a primary disorder or an underlying uh, medical condition. And anywhere that we are assessing this child, besides the clinical condition, history of the child is important to go into the family history. So investigations already we mentioned, we need to look into the calcium phosphorus, alkaline phosphorus, and vitamin D to rule out whatever you can treat this. So if there is rickets, as you've seen in Dr. Kiran's uh, talk also, that's that the osteoporosis is because of an underlying condition and we need to treat that who may not need this phosphorus. Bone turnover markers, a lot of bone turnover markers are available, but really this does not play a role in the diagnosis or even in the therapeutic plan. Could play a role in a therapeutic management, but not in a diagnostic uh, factor. It is more for the research use. Very important to rule out a secondary cause of osteoporosis. So, obviously, you need to look at all the causes that have just said uh, and do the investigations accordingly. DEXA scan, as, as Dr. Kubi has mentioned, that DEXA scan would be telling us about bone mineral density. We do have the uh, PQCT, but again, we need to understand we are, our reference ranges are not robust. We don't even have that in all these centers. So, that may not be uh, over the DEXA scan. DEXA scan still plays an important role in our. Country. Again, DEXA scan needs to have all the important factors that I've mentioned, and it has to be a Z score. Adult is T score, children is Z score. So, while interpreting the uh, DEXA scan, it's important to take into uh, consideration all these factors. Besides that, because we are talking about the vertebra, so we need to have the lateral uh, lumbar spine or radiogra, and in the primary disorders, we need to look into the genetic analysis. Treatment. As has been going on since the first session, it is multidisciplinary team. Okay, Dr. Kiran spoke about multidisciplinary drugs. Here it is multidisciplinary team, and it starts from pediatrician goes to almost like a, uh, a social worker because obviously it's a long term treatment that is required. We cannot ignore the role of the physiotherapist, the uh, dental care, the dentist, and the orthopedician in this care, besides the endocrinologist. So any child who has primary osteoporosis, this team is needed. Secondary osteoporosis, as I said, if there is an optimal management of the underlying cause, then there would be a there could be a not would be, but there could be a spontaneous resolution of the osteoporosis, including the remodeling of the vertebral compression fractures. So just because they are having these chronic conditions, we should not subject every child to this osteoporosis. 
So the primary bone disorders, what is the principle of management? So primary disorders, we, we have seen osteogenesis imperfecta is the most common in that. And there also, it is about the mild, moderate, severe that come, comes into the place. So nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. As Ma'am also mentioned, why not give it indoor then just look for the supplementation. But in these children, supplementation will not play an important role because they have an underlying disorder. So make sure that they have the optimal dietary intake of calcium besides the calcium supplementation which is 500 to 1000 milligram per day, depending on the age group. Vitamin D, 600 is what is written as a cutoff, but these children may require as high as 2000 international units per day as well. So the vitamin D and the calcium requirements that we talk about normal children may not be applicable to these primary osteoporotic children. Uh, adequate nutrition, I, I, I think Ruby has mentioned enough about proteins, micronutrients, so it plays a very important role. Again, overweight and underweight. So certain children, they, because they are immobilized, they put on weight and that will be a vicious circle for causing a, a decreased bone health and, and obviously a, a risk factor for fractures or deformity. Timely puberty progression. So all these uh, children who are under who have these primary disorder may have some delay in the puberty. So we have to make sure that their puberty induction is done on time or at least they have the puberty on time and the progression is taken care of. Besides that is the activity, it's the strengthening and it is the mobility which is important. So high impact, short term exercise is very important. We need to be sure that whenever we are asking about these strengthening exercises, how weak or strong these bones are. So first we need to make sure that the bones are, are okay to give them this kind of an exercise. So physiotherapists will go gradually in a graded exercise to help them out. The time of mobilization and time of standing is very important. So there was one osteogenesis uh, and shown by Dr. Kiran. It was important to give those braces and those supports so that the child can move around, otherwise the child was on the bed throughout the pandemic period. Newer techniques like vibration is, is coming into play to help with the muscle strengthening and mobility. Reduce the risk factor, so it is important that no contact spots, no running around, no jumping. When they are in the wheelchairs, they should be strapped. When they are taken to the washrooms, they brought back to the, uh, the bedrooms, everything needs to be taken care of. Pharmacotherapy. The only answer that we have, if need be, is this person. Even though we have denosumab, it is still not, we do not have enough literature for children and long term uh, management of children on denosumab. Surgical management will be required as and when the deformities need correction once the bones have been strengthened. Okay, so the practical approach to an infant with recurrent fractures, very important. It has to be distinguished between an OI and a non accidental injury because there could be an abuse in the child, so you need to go into the details of the history in this age group. And there would be metabolic bone disease of prematurity, so we need to look into the antenatal history and the uh, history at birth. Okay, so this is what we need to find out in an infant. In an OI, yes, blue sclera is diagnostic, but not every classification of OI will have blue sclera. There would be also gray, gray sclera. Also, when you see these sclera, even living children have blue sclera. So we need to know that not all blue sclera is osteogenesis imperfect. Non-accidental injury will have uh, other injuries as well. You know, if you look at the eyes, you look at the other parts of the body, there will be injuries. We need to assess their length, weight, and the nutrition status. Again, the same kind of investigations need to be seen. X-rays will be helpful in, in, in distinguishing between the OI and the uh, non-accidental injury. And bisphosphonate therapy is only indicated with severe bone fragility. Usually, there is a resolution of osteopenia of the uh, prematurity as well. Non-accidental injury is usually, you have to make sure that the child is not abused anymore. It's only osteogenous imperfecta which would require bisphosphonate therapy. The children who don't require any therapy should be on a close follow every six months till two years of age. So now an approach to a child with chronic disorders. So again, we need to know what was the onset, how much time the child has spent in that illness, what kind of treatment the child has spent, what has happened to its mobility, what has happened to its, you know, the blood products and, and, and the exposure to the nutrition. So there are a lot of things that we need to look at, time of puberty and the kind of fractures. Again, we need to see how is the muscle strength in these children. The investigations remain the same, but we have to also look into the secondary disorders and take care of that. Treatment, optimize the primary. So primary disease, if not optimized, there will be absolutely no help from the bisphosphonates in these children. Okay, make sure that nutrition, vitamin D, calcium, all supplementations are taken care of. There is mobility, there's enough mobility as per the allowance of the disease. And bisphosphonate therapy is only judged on children having those fractures. So if these children 
So for example, we had a leukemic child who had presented with bone pain and there were crushed vertebral compression fractures. So in these children, after giving the induction phase in the maintenance phase two, for the child to be mobile, we had to give the discostomy. So sometimes you may have to intervene early than later, depending upon where the fractures are and how those fractures are making the child immobile. Okay, and follow up, although again, you know, once this underlying disease is taken care of, you need to have a six monthly to yearly follow up and a Texas scan, which is yearly done. Most of them will kind of revert back. We probably will not need to give them this phosphorus. But when it comes to thalassemia, which is a lifelong problem, we probably will need the disphosphonates at certain age. May not be true for conditions which are malignant, like leukemia, because it will be for a short duration. Now, a child which has no underlying chronic illness. So, this is where the endocrinologist area is. This is where your OIs are going to be. And it is important to find out what kind of a trauma. So, it could be a low trauma. Just walking, just sitting, just changing diapers would cause the trauma. And the kind of fracture, the healing time to fracture, the intervention for fracture, and the deformity that this fracture has caused. So, this is not going to be a normal fracture that a healthy child is going to suffer from. Okay, it is important to ask about the family history, not just about the fractures, but about the joint laxity, about the hypermobility, about how the handwriting, what is happening with the teeth, what is happening with the, uh, with the, uh, the wound healing. So all this, even in the family, will give us some pointers to what is happening with this child and the diet and the medication history. Examination is the same thing. We need to look into the muscle, eyes, wounds. Okay, uh, rule out any chronic illness. Genetic analysis will be important over here because the diagnosis whether this child will require a long term disposal or a short term disposal will be by the genetic analysis. Again, the management is multidisciplinary treatment. So, coming to osteogenesis imperfecta, it's also called as brittle bone disease, where there is increased bone fragility with low bone mass. The severity varies from lethality in utero to uh, even perinatally to mildly increase susceptibility to fractures in much later life. So if we go to the uh, family history, sometimes we don't have the parents who had fractures during childhood, but they had it when they were adults. So these are the milder varieties which got missed and we actually can't kind of came to know because of their children. The silence classification had started with four types of OI, then modified to five, then last we know about 13, but it's now 19. So there are more genes than just the collagen 1 E1 and collagen 1 E2. There are much more genes which can cause osteogenesis imperfecta. Okay, and what is osteo, uh, osteoporosis in, in, this, in this condition is because of the inheritable errors of bone formation and mineralization, which is caused by the genetic variants affecting the osteoblastogenesis and its function, collagen synthesis, processing, and formation of the hydroxy appetite. So it's not just about the collagen, and hence our genetics have moved even beyond what we know about osteogenesis imperfecta. So this is how the typical, uh, sorry, uh, the look of the osteogenesis imperfecta with the blue sclera, sclera. So look at this blue sclera versus what the anemic child will have as endogenous imperfecta, which will be there. Look at the deformities uh, in this child. Look at the scoliosis that this child has. Okay, there could be hearing impairment. There could be a joint in hypermobility, and there could be a famous cervical junction instance. So we need to do, uh, if you don't have a clear-cut family history, we need to do a genetic study to find out what kind of an osteogenesis is imperfecta, whether it's an osteogenesis is imperfecta and which gene. Differential diagnosis in infancy would be abuse and metabolic bone disease, but most of the times, osteogenesis is imperfecta without any association or in any of the deformities, fractures with this kind of a feature, with no other association would be osteogenesis is imperfecta. So macular alveolar syndrome, which was talked about, it's a fibrous dysplasia. So it's the popcorn-like appearance that we see in the bones. It will be very different uh, appearance on the bone or on the X-ray than what we see. And they would have caffeine, they would have precocious puberty, hypothyroidism, even hypophosphatemic leakage. There are more, much more associations in them. But the treatment for the bone health is still responsible in there, but they will require other treatment. So these are the X-rays that you see, and that's also been shown by Dr. Puri. So it's the vermilion bones on the skull, which will differentiate from the abuse that is there in the child. Then the vertebral, the fish-shaped vertebral uh, column, look at the thin cortices. So these are the differentiating factors from the non-accidental injury. Okay. There are a lot of treatment that has been mentioned for osteogenesis and impact. Because this person is the only treatment that is available in pediatric osteogenesis and impact. Again, we need this whole team. Uh, to take care of it. How long do we continue this for Two years, four years? Two years. Uh, 
corazón. So we have the answer in terms of sodium salts. So bisphosphonates. Okay, so the second part of the topic is bisphosphonates. So what happens with the bisphosphonates is this this oxygen linking. This oxygen linking is changed by a carbon, and there are two more chains which is attached to it. Okay, and this causes the this binds to the hydroxyapatite of the bone, and it, it kind of reduces the solubility of the, uh, the mineralization. And the second chain helps in increasing the duration and the potency of this strong bone. So this is what the bisphosphonates does. Okay, when the second chain has a nitrogen atom, it becomes even more potent. So that is why bisphosphonates, which are simple, do not have the nitrogen atom, and the, and the complex one has the nitrogen atom, which increases the potential, the potency, the duration of the bisphosphonates. So they generate the calcium ions from the hydroxyapatite and are targeted to the bone within the resorption lacuna beneath on the osteoclast. It dissociates into the osteoclast, inhibits the cell's energy uh, capacity and leading to the apoptosis. This decreases the bone resorption and volume, but it does not impair the osteoclast mediated, uh, mediated the synthesis of the new bone. So there is increase in bone mass and the strength. So as I mentioned, there's simple bisphosphonates and there is uh, complex. The complex ones are the ones which contain nitrogen and the ones that we have heard about, which is aluminate and sodium acid. We also have oral bisphosphonates like aluminate, which is used for adults, but we have limited data on oral bisphosphonates in children and they are not used. The only treatment that we have in bisphosphonates is pamidronate and sodium acid. Uh, the effect is seen immediately after administration. Hence, it is important that whenever a child is receiving this phosphonase, an endocrinologist opinion and the management form has to be taken because the passion levels decline immediately. We have seen many children receive the phosphonase on daycare procedure and on daycare and in, on day two and day three, they landed up in the ER with the So these are very dangerous products. It's not to be taken in very lightly. There are ways how to be given. There are ways how you can Titrate the dose, it may not be the same dose. There is a loading dose, there is a maintenance dose, so it has to be under the guidance of a pediatric endocrinologist. Also, as I said, there are these agents have to be used till the child is grown. So if we don't use it, there'll be a strong bone, there'll be a weak bone, and between the two bones, there will be increased fracture, there'll be increased uh, deformity, so it does not help the child. So it has to be as long as the child is growing. And because we give it for such a long time, there are cumulative effects of this bisphosphonates. So the indications we know it's about OI, it also, we also know it's about the glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. What we also should know that this can be this should be used in DMDs, especially before they go onto the wheelchair, so that though they don't become a wheelchair bound. So we know certain things, but these are the newer guidelines where they say that before seven years of age, if there is a DMD, after seven years of age, or up to seven years, that's when they start the depressive mode as well. So there's going to be chronic steroids, there's going to be an immobility, there's going to be a muscle weakness. So there are good guidelines to tell us that bisphosphonates are required in this okay. Hypercalcemia, obviously, this is not the topic, but as we saw that the calcium declines, so that's the reason bisphosphonates are used in hypercalcemia. Now the outcome is to increase the bone mineral density, reduce the fracture and the bone pain. So that's what happens to the child. It may not, it decrease the deformity, but it is the rate of fracture, it is the bone quality, and it is the quality of life which changes with which the child can now bear the weight on the muscle, they, they can do the activity and they, they may become mobile and thus not well bound. So duration, as I mentioned, till they continue to grow. Very important is this part. Okay. First dose, usually you do see this fever, malaise, and myalgia, which is uh, which can respond by uh, response to analgesic and antipyretic, may not happen immediately, and hence it, it cannot be given on daycare basis. It can happen on day two and day three. So this is these needs to be told to them. Hypocalcemia, very important. First, first time if the child is receiving bisphosphonates, there has there has to be a decision taken one to pre-medicate this child with calcium, vitamin D, not in a vitamin D deficiency. Even though there are doses which are mentioned all over it, all of you will find the doses. The doses can be changed depending upon what is the condition of the bone. We can even start at 25% or 50% of the dose to see how the child is tolerating this and then subsequently increase the zone. So even if we say loading, loading does not always mean bombardment in these children. It could be even a lower dose. So very careful with the dose of how we give, when we give, and how do we monitor. So it's, it's a long thing that we look at. And the uh, iritis and atypical femoral fracture and osteoporosis of jaw, these are not seen in children. So, you know, the parents read this and they kind of go away from this person. This is more for the adults. Very important is this part. 
long term use can suppress the bone turnover and contribute to the hypermineralization so giving like a osteopetrosis kind of a picture this will make the bones even more fragile and even more fracture so that's why it is not that every six month the child has to receive this dose till the time the child finishes the flow so there is an, again a titration of dose that needs to be done in viscosinics even in children with oi or with secondary underlying medical condition so just to summarize this is just an algorithm for any child who has multiple long fractures so not one fracture it's, it's a multiple long fracture one fracture could be vertebral fracture we need to exclude trauma and abuse in any and abuse in a long in a younger child and trauma in a older child and the height of fall okay it is important to know how many fractures are there so the significant fracture will definitely need a detailed fracture history family history nutritional history also need to rule out any secondary disorders which is there in this child so if they don't have deformities but someone has just done an exa and you get there something wrong in that just don't start reading try to find if there's a common disorder in this child by the history examination and investigations and if this is not a secondary disorder which can be taken care of then this person is can be considered but if the number of fractures are less than the clinically significant fracture then it is a general bone health measurements that we need to look into which is the supplementation the mobility and making sure that the weight bearing exercise is done the puberty is happening on time and make sure that whatever treatment is affecting the bone health once it's taken care of what is happening subsequently to these children thank you Just saying that it is important when you give bisphosphonates, pre-medicate and post-medication is very important. So just because they receive the bisphosphonates, you don't stop the calcium. You may have to continue for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Ranjit Sardarkar sir, uh, who is a senior pediatric nephrologist from uh, INS Ashwini Hospital. He'll be talking about uh, chronic kidney disease and its various effects on bone. Thank you. As an MD resident, and uh, the first patient of CKD came to us, and the most confusing aspect used to be how do you manage mineral bone disease? What do you do about calcium phosphate, parathormone? How do you measure this damn hormone? What do you do about it? It was total confusion. 
So I've tried to make it simple and I've tried to concentrate a bit on pathophysiology. Okay. So uh, historically, the good news is that, you know, people before us were also confused. They used the word renal rickets. Then they talked about the osteitis fibrosis cystica. So they realized later on that it's not just bones becoming uh, pliable. They realized that there is more to it. There are different types of bone diseases. So they called it renal osteodystrophy. And then there was a realization that it's not just about the bones. It's also about the tissue, which is outside the bone. And in fact, that is the most critical outcome in chronic kidney disease. And since we know that uh, CKD affects at least 5 to 10% of the population, majority are at risk of this condition called mineral bone disease. So it is a triad which includes not just the bone, but it also includes lab abnormalities and cardiovascular disease. In fact, the entire extra-renal tissue can also be involved in mineral and bone disease. And cardiovascular disease is the cause, the leading cause of mortality in chronic kidney disease. So what is it? It's a systemic disorder of mineral and bone metabolism due to CKD manifested by either one or a combination of abnormalities of calcium, phosphate, PTH or vitamin D metabolism, abnormalities in bone turnover, mineralization, volume, linear growth and strength or vascular or other soft tissue calcification. So we'll be coming to the details of each of these subsequently. Now, why I'm going to dwell a little more on pathogenesis, although you know it's for clinicians, it's because once we know the pathogenesis, we are able to treat it better. And secondly, there's a lot of confusion. What came first? Phosphate, vitamin D, parathormone. What is this FGF23? Is there a role of sclerostin? So as our uh, you know, home minister says, So as uh, we can see here that classically it was thought that it's all about the phosphate being accumulated as the kidney fails. But they realized that this uh, FGF23 rises very early in CKD, in fact, right up from CKD stage 2. And it seems to be compensating for the uh, phosphate retention in the initial stages. After that, the vitamin D level starts falling and only then does the parathormone rise and then does the phosphate rise. So the rise of phosphate occurs very late in CKD. So if you are trying to look for MBD by phosphate, it's going to be very late. And this is what caused the change in the concept of pathophysiology. The initial model was one of basically the classical trade-off hypothesis where they said that there's an increase in phosphate, which is going to precipitate the calcium, which is going to cause reduction in calcium. There's also going to be a reduction in the uh, you know, uh, deficiency of uh, vitamin D. And that actually causes the parathormone stimulation. Whereas now it is believed that it's actually the FGF23 which starts acting first. It, uh, it initially normalizes the serum phosphate. But at the same time, it inactivates vitamin D. It actually, which finally results in the stimulation of the parathormone. So as we all know, it's, this is the basic slide where, uh, where the parathormone gland is secreted, we know. The most important thing is that it produces this 84 amino acid hormone called parathormone, which acts on the osteoclast, which increases the blood calcium. Now, it is regulated by what? It is regulated by this calcium sensing receptor. It is also regulated by the vitamin D receptor and there are vitamin D responsive elements inside the cell. It also responds to FGF uh, clotho, which we will come to uh, shortly. These are the three players, FGF receptor, the calcium sensing receptor and the vitamin D receptor. What does parathormone do? This is a slight oversimplification of the role of parathormone, but it stimulates the osteoclast to mobilize calcium. It increases renal tubule absorption of calcium. It inhibits the proximal renal tubular reabsorption of phosphate. It indirectly induces an increase in intestinal calcium absorption. It, it also uh, stops the proximal renal tubule absorption of uh, bicarb, sodium, potassium, water, amino acids. Most importantly, it promotes bone remodeling. Low parathormone can stimulate bone formation in fact. Indirectly increases intestinal calcium absorption by stimulating vitamin D synthesis. Now, one issue with uh, the high parathormone in chronic kidney disease is that there is, for multiple reasons, a lack of response to parathormone. The uremic factors themselves downregulate the receptors to parathormone, but apart from that, low levels of active vitamin D3, uh, uh, high levels of FGF23, 
the new player we will not discuss these too much in detail because their role is a little missed but uh, sclerostyle which is which is a part of the wind signaling pathway will soon be heard about more and more in this disease and of course the other uremic toxin although they cause an increase in the uh, parathormone they cause a reduction in its effect so uh, finally it comes to the bone where there is a trade off between adynamic bone disease and osteitis fibrosis now what is the role of the phosphate it is it rises late in in uh, ckd but once it rises it binds calcium and it causes it to precipitate so we talk about the calcium phosphate product it also stimulates fgf23 release now what is this fgf23 it is an abnormal fgf because fgfs are in many parts of the body but they require heparin sulfate to act and they are largely autocrine or paracrine but this one is different because it does not have affinity to heparin sulfate so it requires something called clotho which is a uh, clotho is a co receptor for its action it's it's regulated by these genes p hex and dmp1 which uh, dr kiran talked about in uh, hypophosphatemic rickets so what we are dealing with is something uh, quite the opposite what it does is it reduces the phosphate reabsorption from the tubule by reducing its uh, 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 its uh, uh, its the uh, the receptor it down regulates one alpha hydroxylase up regulates 24 hydroxylase so it's like a counter regulatory hormone for vitamin d what happens in ckd there are increased levels of fgf23 increased production decreased breakdown decreased excretion stimulation by phosphate retention and finally it what it does is it compensates initially the phosphate retention but later on this mechanism fails it may also regulate pth secretion it reduces active vitamin d and causes ventricular hypertrophy now this clotho is again a newly uh, we talked we started talking about clotho only in the last 20 years so uh, it's very interesting to know that clotho was considered the greek goddess who gave the thread of life now why this is interesting is that when they knocked out clotho in rats they realized that they aged very prematurely and died early if there was more of clotho they lived longer similarly the opposite effects were found with phosphate retention when they retained phosphate they aged quickly and died quickly and if they if they were able to secrete their phosphates on time they lived longer so it's something like an age suppressor gene it's interestingly although phosphates are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule it, they are it's present more in the distal tubule and how it uh, you know uh, has its uh, phosphatonic action is not very clear but its expression may be controlled partially by vitamin d and the deficiency of this clotho actually may explain the resistance to uh, fgf23 we know about 125 hydroxy vitamin d uh, we know that it's activated in the kidney it uh, it uh, it uh, it, uh, it is absorbed it's responsible for increasing the calcium level it also helps in uh, suppressing the parathormone so at the same time we know that uh, ckd patients are deficient in vitamin d but in case they are supplemented fgf23 is secreted there are studies which show that and they suppress it suppresses pth now this is the sunshine vitamin uh, there are there is a large number of reasons why people with ckd are deficient of it because they eat less they have been told not to have dairy products they don't go out and they are also proteinuric so they lose the uh, vitamin d binding protein but it's interesting to know that 25 hydroxy vitamin d even without activation can suppress pth and has some anti inflammatory action on especially on the cardiovascular system so one of the dictums of treating mbd is that they should be vitamin d replete so as far as vitamin d is concerned it is don't underestimate the power of a common man now what does the parathormone do it why it comes in here is that pre pro parathormone is 50 115 amino acids it comes to pro pth which is 90 amino acids and intact parathormone is 1 to 84 amino acids the active part is there's the first 30 first 30 to 34 amino acids and this has a lot of role in its uh, action now coming to what happens to the bones we have to understand it in terms of three parts one is the, the tmv so it is turnover mineralization and volume so you can have any one or more of these uh, components affected so as we can see in this 3d pro, uh, you know uh, diagram over here we can see that the mineralization effect is normal but there is a very high uh, you know bone volume 
with the normal turnover, we get osteitis fibrosa, which is the crooked bones. If it is uh, a situation where the turnover is um, on the lower side, the uh, mineralization is normal and the volume is also normal, we get a dynamic bone disease. This is what happens when we give too much of vitamin D. Uh, osteomalacia is about just defective mineralization. Uh, uh, mixed uremic osteodystrophy is a combination of all of these. So, the bone disease, renal osteodystrophy is not a very straightforward disease. Uh, there are multiple components to it and therefore, bone biopsy has been the gold standard for the diagnosis. What we assess it by is parathormone, which indicates chiefly turnover. So, that's why we are not very confident on this. Cardiovascular disease. Now, in addition to the traditional risk factors for uh, CKD, uh, for uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, children or adults also with CKD have got some specific risk factors, which includes toxic metabolites, albuminuria, inflammation, oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction, anemia and malnutrition, which finally cause cardiomyopathy, atherosclerosis, arterial stiffening and calcification. Now, what is peculiar in, uh, in uh, mineral bone disease is this part, where we learn that it is actually the tunica media, where there is all the muscular cells. The muscle cells seem to be getting replaced by osteocytes. It's interesting to note that they have a common origin and they start differentiating into osteocytes and there is calcification of the, uh, the, the uh, media. Again, another important part of uh, CKD MBD is left ventricular hypertrophy. So all these things happen. We can have uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, we can have arrhythmia, but the specific component to it, which is related to mineral bone diseases, left ventricular hypertrophy, it is most likely related to an action of FGF23, which is independent of clotho. So how do we diagnose CKD MBD? Uh, for renal osteodystrophy, the gold standard remains bone biopsy, but it's extremely invasive and we don't resort to it unless there is a specific clinical question. In fact, a therapeutic question which has to be answered. We look at bone radiographs, we look at parathormone as a bone turnover uh, biomarker. The, of course, the other biomarkers, as uh, you know, in the previous presentation, we don't look at it routinely. Calcium and phosphate are, of course, therapeutic targets. 25 hydroxy vitamin D has to be replete. For the vascular disease, we look at carotid intimal medial thickness. Although electron beam CT is the gold standard, it's not easily available. And in children, lateral X rays uh, of the abdomen are considered to be one of the ways in which we screen for. Uh, calcification in the aorta. And of course, we can also do flow mediated dilatation using an ultrasound. Cardiac disease, of course, uh, with a 2D echo and ECG for the arrhythmia. Now, this is uh, the interesting part about the parathormone. Uh, why there is a lot of confusion about the parathormone assays is that the first generation assay, they were looking at only the middle part of the parathormone. So it was measuring active and inactive parathormone. What actually happens is that the first 34, this, this breaks into two parts. The first 34 amino acids go into the kidney, they're excreted in the kidney to a certain extent reabsorbed, whereas the rest of the uh, 34 to 84 is broken down by the liver. Now, both these mechanisms get altered in CKD and there is an accumulation of fragments. So, when the first generation assays were measuring uh, parathormone, they were measuring active and inactive uh, parathormone as well, and we never knew what was happening. The second generation and the third generation assays, they are actually, they've got, uh, they measure two parts of the hormone. So it has to be binding one part, which is in the 1 to 30 region and one part in the distal region. The distal part is common to the third, to the two generations of assay. But in the second generation assay, it is looking at uh, something beyond the 18th amino acid. And in the third generation, it is looking more proximally. There's not much difference between second and third generation assays. The problem here is that even if we are measuring intact parathormone, many of these methionine amino acids which are over here, they get oxidized because of CKD. We know that CKD is a condition of oxidative stress. If it is oxidized, this version of the parathormone will not work. So there are specific assays for measuring that part of PTH which is not oxidized, but commercially these assays are not available. As a result, we still don't know what is going on to its fullest, fullest extent. So how do we measure? Now coming to recommendations. So it's obvious that in the first initial stages of, uh, of CKD, we just look at calcium and phosphate once in 6 to 12 months. And it becomes more frequent as the disease progresses. Alkaline phosphatase, uh, we start measuring a bit later in the course of the disease. 
Of course, in the OPD, it's quite routine. We do measure these much more frequently than this. This is actually the bare minimum. 25 hydroxy vitamin D, we should measure it once, supplement it, and we should give uh, regular maintenance, and that should do the needful. But if there is a doubt, it can be measured again. Parathormone, 6 to 12 monthly in uh, CKD4, and more frequently when it is CKD5. Uh, again, therapeutic decisions are based on trends rather than individual values. We also measure height, which is most, most important as a clinical measurement and length in infants. Osteoporosis, again, BMD studies, they have their limitations, but they can be performed. But they are, they, we don't see so much of pure osteoporosis in the uh, garden variety CKD. It can happen when we are supplementing steroids post-transplant. And if there is confusion, there are specific indications for bone biopsy. And of course, we also have to assess for cardiovascular disease. Now, how do we treat it? The aims of the treatment, therefore, now that we've understood the pathophysiology, it is that we must maintain the calcium and phosphate within the normal limits. We must prevent hyperplasia of the parathyroid. Now, why does this happen? Because uh, if I, I think I'll go back to the previous slide to make this point a little more clear. Yeah, so normally what happens is that if there is a receptor and a ligand, more of the ligand is going to come, make the receptors go down, but in the parathyroid, there is a positive feedback cycle. So if there is more of active vitamin D, the vitamin D receptors also increase. If there is more calcium, the number of calcium sensing receptors also increase. So if there is a hypertrophy, so when it's late in the stage of CKD, there may be a situation where the, para, uh, the parathyroid gland has reached critical mass and it's not going to get suppressed. And this can, you know, happen even after transplant. Uh, to avoid the risk of extraskeletal calcification and to prevent the accumulation of toxic substances. So these are our therapeutic uh, armaments, active vitamin D, uh, phosphate binders, and calcium mimetics. So there are the most important uh, phosphate reduction strategy is dietary restriction. Uh, there are strategies to reduce intestinal obstruction uh, uh, absorption. The most common, of course, is using the calcium binder. The other therapies are still experimental. They are being developed. So what are the recommendations that target age-appropriate levels of calcium and phosphate? In case the patient is on dialysis, maintain calcium in the dialysis at the normal levels. Decisions for phosphate-lowering treatment should be based on progressively or persistently elevated serum phosphate and base the choice of phosphate-lowering therapy based on the serum calcium levels. So now, uh, these uh, are the limits which were set actually by the Kedoki guidelines. There are different limits which are set by different uh, guidelines, but what is important is that we must understand that everything has a physiological range. And the younger the child, we accept slightly higher levels of calcium and slightly higher levels of phosphate. Again, uh, the thumb rule is that the, uh, the parathormone in the later stages of CKD, we target a level which is two to nine times the upper limit of normal. So how do we restrict phosphate? We have to cut down on the phosphate risk pool. How do we measure phosphate in the diet? We take a dietary diary and whatever we feel is the protein, the thumb rule is that 15 into the protein is equal to the phosphate the patient is taking. This usually, may, we may not have time in a busy OPD. We may take the help of a dietitian for this, but this is very important to restrict the amount of uh, uh, phosphate. If phosphate is elevated, we must restrict it to 80% of the DRI. Now, it's theoretically very, very easy to say that start cutting down on phosphate early in the, st in the, in the uh, stage of CKD. But the problem is that anything which is rich in calcium is also rich in phosphate, typically dairy. And any phosphate that, any low phosphate diet is also unpalatable. And when we look at the general management of uh, chronic kidney disease, the child must have adequate proteins first. The phosphate, we may have to control with the help of a phosphate binder because the growth and general health of the child is more important. So we, we, we advise foods which are relatively poor in phosphates. Now, coming to phosphate binders, uh, of course, uh, aluminum-based binders are, uh, are still preferred in conditions such as tumulitis syndrome, but long-term use in CKD is a bad idea because of their bad uh, ill effects on the brain as well as on CKD MBD itself. The calcium-based binders are, uh, you know, are sheet anchor of treatment, followed by cevalamide. The magnesium-based binders are not much in favor. Lanthanum is not yet approved in children. And the iron-based binders theoretically are good, but they have not become popular because of their side effects. 
so we come to the commonly used uh, you know uh, uh, calcium binders now the thumb rule is that we use initially a calcium binding uh, a calcium based phosphate binder for the simple reason that it will also supplement calcium most of these children are hypocalcemic but we cannot exceed 2000 grams of calcium overall and 1500 grams through a calcium uh, uh, based phosphate binder uh there is no actual dose but it's dose as per how much actually binds uh, 100 mg of phosphate so we can understand the the importance of uh, restriction of phosphate in the diet because as as much as 2500 is required to bind 100 mg so the next step is to go in for sevalimet now when do we use sevalimet carbonate when do we use phosphate which is sevalimet hydrochloride sevalimet hydrochloride is a little better if calcium is on the higher side sevalimer bicarbonate is uh, carbonate is better if there is acidosis uh, we must make it a point to see to it that you know we don't give uh, something like uh, a ppi or a, a, a antacid when the child is on sevalimer hydrochloride because it requires the acidic ph of the stomach to get broken down uh, calcium carbonate or shell cal is the uh, the calcium based binder of choice uh targeting now next part of management of ckt mbd is targeting the high pth so we don't know the exact targets in the early stages of ckt but approximately 2 to 9 times the upper limit of normal in ckt 5 this is because of the vagaries of measurement of pth and various commercial assays and of course how we collect the sample the first steps of course are the usual steps correct hyperphosphatemia correct hypocalcemia uh, uh, correct the high phosphate intake correct the vitamin d deficiency the next step is to use active vitamin d uh, in fact uh, the next step of course is to correct the active vitamin d in the uh, in the later stages of ckd if uh, the if it goes beyond control as per the ktgo they talk about parathyroidectomy but we have one thing before that that is the use of a calcium mimetic so these are the doses of 125 hydroxy vitamin d i'll not walk you through the entire slide but uh, these doses are available with the ktgo ki recommendation uh now alpha calcitol is a reasonable alternative to these the newer vitamin d's like uh, uh, paracalcitol doxocalciferol they were all brought in with the idea that they will suppress parathormone without increasing calcium and phosphate clinically most trials did not show such an effect so as of now they are not very popular the calcium mimetics are those drugs which actually stimulate the calcium sensing receptor to bring down pth and of course the most commonly used drug is pth 30 or senecalcet there is no real fixed dose but we can start with 0.5 mg per kg per day increase it gradually to 1.5 mg per kg per day and of course if there is a parathyroid adenoma the parathormone remains constantly above 1000 then we may need to go in for a parathyroid so what are the other parts of of treating a ckd mbd if the child remains persistently short despite correcting nutritional problems uh if uh, there is acidosis has also been corrected all the para, para, biochemical parameters of ckd mbd are corrected then we can give growth hormone but there have to be certain prerequisites we've controlled the parathormone we've controlled the phosphate we've excluded active rickets and then we can give growth hormone and still we have to be very sure that uh, we have to monitor for complications like slip capital femoral epiphysis and so on uh we can we also have to give a uh, correction i'm sorry there's a mistake in the slide here so orthopedic correction of angulation deformities can be done once uh, mbd is under control and we feel that renal transplantation treats everything but it's not like that as we mentioned there may still be a critical mass in the parathormone which we have not been able to uh, the parathyroid gland which we are not able to control so we have to continue the patient will suddenly start losing phosphate which is also not always a good thing over and above that the, the patient starts consuming steroids starts consuming uh, calcineurin inhibitors they themselves have their implications on bone metabolism like hypomagnesemia so the patient requires continuous monitoring even after the renal transplant so to sum up ckd mbd is a disease of the of the three b's biochemistry bones and blood vessels it starts early in ckd but becomes obvious a little later the key players are parathormone fgf23 clotho phosphate uh the in the blood it's about low calcium high phosphate elevated alkaline phosphatase in the bones we have to go for the tmb classification parathormone is measuring only the turnover in the cardiovascular system left ventricular hypertrophy and medial calcification the cornerstone of therapy is reducing phosphate and controlling parathormone 
and growth hormone may be required if everything is corrected. So uh, I end with this slide. This is uh, my patient. He's now become more than 20 years and uh, uh, he came to me just about two years ago. Uh, for those of us who know the legend of Ashtavakra, this is the boy. He's bent in more than eight places, but uh, he's as intelligent as anyone. In fact, he, he's a topper in his own class. He's on dialysis, as we can see. His AV fistula is also not in a very good state. But uh, uh, one feels that, you know, had someone paid attention to this a bit earlier, uh, this day would not have come. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Dr. Raji? So he uh, highlighted the other aspect of the case that when you have an EKD which results in hyperphosphatemia and results in uh, mineral bone disease, which is the other term for decades in EKD. So as he suggested that uh, it's not just the phosphate hydrates, but it's as right from early the course of the disease. Uh, If there are no further questions, shall we conclude? If there are any questions, we can have it in the meeting. Okay.
Uh, welcome back everyone. We will be continuing our session. So the timely correction of the bony deformity that we have discussed in our previous sessions plays an important role in the physical growth of these children. Uh, Swapnil Kenisa, who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Sir H and M Hospital, will be uh, talking in brief about this case. A very good afternoon to all of you. At the outset, may I thank uh, the Department of Pediatrics at the HM Reliance Hospital, uh, Parik sir and uh, Dr. Kiran Sate for having me here. I'm going to be speaking about orthopedic corrections of bony deformities. So if you ask an orthopedic surgeon, what is the best time to correct a deformity? He will tell you that the best time to correct a deformity is when the child is fit for surgery. If you ask an anesthetist, when is the best time an orthopedic surgeon feels is the right time to correct a surgery, to do a surgery, then an anesthetist would tell you that probably even if the patient is not fit, he is keen to do the surgery. Now that is a joke in the local folklore. But uh, we know that uh, things are different and there are certain timings which we need to adhere to when we correct these deformities. But this is essentially like a game of chess and one needs to consider the moves when one decides to correct these deformities. Now, I have limited my lecture to essentially deformities which are secondary to metabolic causes because that is what is relevant to today's evening's topic. And hence, I would be doing uh, case presentations of relevant cases and I would want all of you all, the residents as well as the consultants here to participate because as regards the metabolic issues, you all would know more than me. So the moves which we consider as surgeons per se is whether a deformity needs correction. Should I wait for the underlying metabolic cause to be corrected before I do a surgery? Should I wait for the child to grow before I correct the deformity? What is the ideal time to intervene? When is the time one has to intervene? And finally, the philosophy, which I learned over the last 20 years, is you need to think thrice and cut once. Now let's look at the first case. And this is where I would like all of you all to participate. Now this is a one-year-old child, a reasonably all right calcium, reasonably all right phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase is all right. Vitamin D is on the lower side. He's come to me at one year of age. Uh, parents are very apprehensive that our child has got bow legs. So question to the audience, residents, consultants, whether you wait for this deformity to correct on its own or do you correct it? Anybody? Wait, wait. Absolutely. 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 So this is a physiological <laughs> genu varam. And we all know that there is there are physiological deformities when a child is an infant. Uh, they do have varus up to 18 months, it corrects. Then up to three and a half years, they develop valgus, and by seven years, they become all right. So if you only ask these parents to maintain clinical photographs of these children, usually I tend to do that with a date, then they themselves get convinced that these children are correcting 
So many a times you don't need to repeat the x-rays. Though some overzealous parents do end up doing it, but you don't really need to. As you see, from 2015 to 2016, this kid has corrected completely. So he doesn't require anything. This is a physiological deformity. Now let's look at my second case. So this is a question where I should wait for the underlying metabolic cause to correct or should I correct this deformity? I'm just going to play the video for a moment because the video is not playing from here. So let's look at this kid. All right, quite a severe deformity, right? Now, technically, let me play it once again. Right. So now there is definitely a metabolic uh, issue with, with, with this patient. The alkaline phosphatase is 442. Uh, vitamin D is high, but this is essentially the drug which is giving these high vitamin D levels because this kid has come uh, after taking some vitamin D. His parathyroid hormone is 18.5. So what do we do in this case? Should we wait uh, for this deformity to correct on its own or should we do something about it? Yeah, so the answer is wait, but uh, since this deformity was quite severe, I decided that by only waiting, this would be a little bit of a gamble. So in my attempts to convince the parents, I convinced them for a brace. And these are the ones which really, you know, do get corrected on their own, but if the brace is there and with a low vitamin D, many a times they don't kind of, you know, progress. So this is a brace, this is essentially nighttime bracing, very difficult to keep. These are metallic rods on the inner side and uh, with uh, some sort of uh, restraints, but very difficult for the child to keep with the parents. The mother was a dentist and she was able to do it. And uh, eventually that is the follow-up. Uh, this was the COVID period. So between September 2020 to May 2022, if you, can, uh, if you compare both these x-rays, and even if this child, you see them clinic clinically, this deformity is completely corrected. So these are the cases where you need to wait, but also need to intervene, not in a surgical manner, but in a non-surgical manner. Now let's look at the third case. Now, again, I will just show you the video because... Uh... So this is the typical... Uh what you call as O deformity. What you see in a lot of metabolic causes like uh, vitamin D resistant rickets, uh, which is neglected. You also see them in skeletal dysplasias. So this was a vitamin D resistant rickets. And uh, obviously when this kind of children come to you, you cannot not do anything about it, right? You need to do something about it. You cannot wait because you know that just by correcting the metabolic cause, you will not be able to correct this deformity because this deformity is now essentially has a mechanical component to it. So here is where uh, growth modulation or guided growth comes into the picture, wherein what we tend to do is we tend to, in at least the case of Genu Varam, tend to reduce the growth at the level of the physis on the outer side of the bone so that the inner side of the bone grows and catches up and eventually these deformities correct. This is called as guided growth and the implant which we use is called as the eight plate. So growth modulation or guided growth or eight plate is a wonderful armamentaria now in the hands of a surgeon wherein such severe deformities can be corrected. Now this patient actually had a rebound valgus because she was lost to follow up which was eventually corrected again by a medial side epiphysiolysis. So, but you can correct these senior deformities without really having to worry about the metabolic status of the patient. So when you have such severe deformities, you can intervene immediately. Now let's look at my fourth case. Now this is a 16 year old girl with a neglected genome algorithm. Of course, she did have some vitamin D uh, deficiency uh, and she was essentially homebound uh, taking education in a madarsa, and this was the severe deformity she came to me with. Now, what is the ideal time to intervene in this deformity? 
probably now because the physis is fused, this is such a severe deformity, but now this is beyond skeletal maturity. So once this is beyond skeletal maturity, obviously a guided growth will not work. So these are the cases where you need to do osteotomies. So this is a percutaneous dome osteotomy, wherein you make two small cuts, uh, pass the plate within, cut the bone and correct the deformity. This is the post-op. So that is how the CV of the deformity was at 16 years of age, and it's completely corrected. Now the fifth case is essentially where one has to do a surgery. Now these are, this is a acquired oxalara secondary to a skiffy, wherein the child comes with an acute slip. And this is a case where you cannot wait for the metabolic problems to correct. These children usually have hypogonadism or some, some sort of a hormonal imbalance. And in these cases, you actually have to do them in an emergency. So this case needed an open reduction by a safe surgical dislocation approach. And uh, that is the fixation and that is the kid eventually walking. Uh, coming to my last case, and this is essentially what I've learned over the years is that uh, surgery is not the only option. Many a times you actually have to wait. And this is essentially more of a medical case, though I do not have a full follow up on it. But uh, the philosophy is to think thrice and cut once. Now, this eight year old girl came to us from Uttar Pradesh, gradually progressing uh, tibial bowing of last, for the last two years with difficulty in walking. There was a history of progressive weight loss since the last two years. General examination, everything else was normal, but there was a thyroid swelling. Uh, on inspection, there was a bilateral tibial bowing. There was also a windswept deformity and rotational malignment. So this is a very severe, what we call as multi-planar, multi-apical deformity. Uh, quite difficult to correct per se, but by the time we were thinking of correcting these deformities, we had missed a few things, which our endocrinologist luckily pointed out to us specifically about the thyroid swelling and this kind of a hyperlordotic spine with labored walking and exaggerated reflexes. We initially thought that this was a spinal problem. We got an MRI done, MRI was perfectly normal. So hence we were confused as to what needs to be done in this case. So the X-rays showed a generalized osteopenia, pencil thin cortices, multiple loser zones and heel insufficiency fractures, worm eaten appearance of the bones, irregular ossification of epiphysis and multiplanar deformities. So this is an X-ray, which is a combination of rickets plus osteomalacia plus osteoporosis, a very, very confusing picture for an orthopedic surgeon, uh, may not be for a pediatrician, may not be for a pediatric endocrinologist, but something which we see very rarely in our practice. If you look at the calcium profile, the phosphorus was high, alkaline phosphatase was high, LDH was high, uh, the PTH was on the lower side, Renal functions were normal, liver functions were normal again to our uh, surprise, but uh, the thyroid profile was something which, uh, you know, the endocrinologist working in our hospital pointed out to us that there was a low TSH, there was a high T3 and a high T4, and the anti-thyroid antibody, anti-thyroglobulin antibody, which is called as ATG, was almost double. So based upon her evaluation and assessment, this was probably a case of an autoimmune thyroiditis with the differentials of Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. Of course, this is something which I did not know then, and we are learning about this, but they did tell us that the thyroid hormone can affect bone calcium metabolism by direct action on the osteoclasts or by acting on osteoblasts, which in turn mediate osteoclastic resorption. Overt hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism is associated with accelerated bone remodeling, reduced bone density, osteoporosis and an increase in fracture rate. Osteomalacia is also associated with thyrotoxicosis. In hyperthyroidism, subclinical vitamin D deficiency may be precipitated in an overt form. Osteomalacia may coexist with thyrotoxicosis, but may remain undiagnosed unless clinically suspected and biochemically confirmed. Angular deformities of the bone have been reported in adults with thyrotoxicosis, and these tend to correct once the thyroid function is restored. So probably this was one case where the knife may not be required in the near future. So this was a learning experience for us. And the lessons we learned from this case is that do not attempt to correct a deformity till the thyroid function is normalized because things won't work. The first line of treatment of thyroiditis is antithyroid drugs for six to nine months. 
And if that doesn't work, then a total thyroidectomy will, will have to be done to control the disease. And many of these deformities reduce in quantum once the thyroid disease is treated. So these were the lessons we learned from this case. And luckily for us, we did not operate the skin, though this patient is still waiting for surgery and she's not really corrected, but her thyroid levels are now normal. So to summarize my talk for today, essentially deformity correction in children, specifically those which is metabolic, uh, is not something where uh, we need to have arguments about. Essentially, as everybody else has very well elucidated uh, in this uh, webinar and this seminar, is that this is a multisystemic approach. You require a pediatrician, pediatric endocrinologist, pediatric nephrologist, a pediatric surgeon, and a pediatric orthopedic surgeon to work as a team to try and understand not only to give the best to the children who suffer from these disorders, but also prevent us from doing things which would have you know, very, very bad or kind of adverse outcomes. I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Any questions for uh, this session? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I'll be requesting uh, Rahul Verma, sir, who is a senior neonatologist and also head of pediatric and neonatology department at Sir Etienne Reliance Hospital, who will be enlightening uh, us about the topic osteopenia of premature. Rahul Verma, sir, has a Rahul Verma body attached. I think you should stop saying, sir, sir, sir. The rest of the body feels very inside me. <laughs> Dr. Verma is good enough for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Familiar? Spots? Okay. Uh, so I think since afternoon we've been talking a lot about calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D3, the basics, the advanced. I think the most intricate lecture was uh, from Ashwini about chronic kidney disease. And uh, that made me realize I feel much safer as a neonatologist, you know, definitely a good choice. Okay, so coming to osteopenia of prematurity. I don't have this cute little thing, that it's supposed to be disappear at the top. And does it not disappear? Okay, so just a basic thing, it will be a very simple talk, nothing great about uh, osteopenia or what we now call metabolic bone disorder or prematurity. So calcium and phosphorus and many other things in the background are very, very important for bone growth, muscle power, neurological integrity. And we are realizing that much more that it's not just growth and, and the skeleton, but it's actually the neurological activity, which is so very important and various enzymes at cellular level. All of these are governed by normal calcium and phosphorus. Level. Uh, this is a very simple diagram of how we are involved with calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D3 absorption and metabolism in the body. What are the other factors which govern? Even I feel like looking outside. Is it something good? Sorry, I could not help. Okay, so <laughs> screen. Screen? You want it down? Oh, there's a screen over here. Yeah, we do funny things over here, you know. So <laughs> sorry. So so basically uh, the whole metabolism revolves around maintaining calcium in the blood 
deposition of adequate calcium into the bones. And of course, at the intracellular level, which once again is very important for normal functioning. Similarly goes for phosphorus. And these two are governed by vitamin D3, calcitonin, magnesium. All of these factors will affect the calcium and phosphorus metabolism. We need to understand that roughly 50% of calcium and phosphorus, which a baby intakes, will ultimately reach the system and 50% will get excreted, whether it is calcium or whether it's phosphorus. So obviously, as much as you push in, there's going to be a limit how much comes in. On the other hand, the requirement, especially for a preterm infant, is going to be way much more. So if the normal requirement for a term baby is around 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram per day of calcium, for a preterm, it may go 160 to 200 milligrams per kilogram per day. And if you do your calculations right, if you're using human milk, roughly 28 to 35 milligrams of calcium per 100 ml. So you're left with a deficit of around 150 milligrams of calcium per kilogram. So that is something which we need to remember, especially when we want to prevent osteopenia of prematurity. Also, osteopenia of prematurity is something which is primarily because of low phosphorus or excretion of phosphorus and inadequate intake of phosphorus rather than low calcium intake. Both are important, but phosphorus plays a much more important So basically, when we come to trying to define osteopenia of prematurity, we believe it's a metabolic bone disease, especially seen in preterm infants, in which a reduced bone mineral content occurs primarily as a result of lack of adequate intake of calcium, adequate intake of phosphorus, and possibly an increased excretion of phosphorus in the urine. And this is all happening in the extra uterine line. When we talk about calcium absorption, I don't know, uh, did someone speak about calcium absorption in the, across the placenta? No, so it's an active process. So that's why you see that the fetal and baby's calcium levels immediately after birth are higher than the mother's serum calcium levels. So that's an active thing. However, when we absorb calcium from the gut, it is both a passive as well as an active process. So passive process is giving calcium, it just moves across as a mineral, but the active process is governed by vitamin D. So this is the basic thing. Uh, coming on further, the bone mineral content of a preterm infant is significantly reduced with respect to the expected level of mineralization for the fetus or the preterm infant of comparable size or gestation. And this problem of osteopenia prematurity is very commonly seen in less than 34 weeks or less than 1.5 kilogram babies. And of course, as the gestation reduces and the weight reduces, the problem increases exponentially. The basis of this problem is the fact that mineral accretion, especially calcium and phosphorus, is at its maximum in the third trimester. So anything which interrupts attainment of full three trimesters will obviously cut down the intake of calcium. So these babies are already deficient in mineral accretion. On top of that, we do not manage to give adequate nutrition in adequate amounts, which further increases this deficit. And ultimately, such babies will land up into osteopenia. Roughly anywhere between 3% to almost 20% of babies will manifest with osteopenia of prematurity, especially after the first six to eight weeks, because osteopenia of prematurity is not diagnosed initially. It is usually a diagnosis after discharge. So that is something where monitoring of such babies is very important. Coming to factors affecting neonatal bone health, so rapid growth. Babies as it is grow very rapidly, and as I said, if you do not have sufficient intake, the deficit keeps on increasing and you're going to have not only a relative, but an absolute deficiency of calcium and phosphorus and vitamin D3 and magnesium. All these factors will affect neonatal bone health. Accretion, as I said, in the third trimester is maximum. So obviously premature 
deliveries, pre-term deliveries, will cut this down further. So you're going to have that deficit coming in. Intestinal absorption, as I had mentioned, can be passive and active. Active takes calcium across much better than the passive absorption. And that is absent usually, not only because of prematurity, delayed feeding, necrotizing enterocolitis, short gut, a lot of these factors ultimately affect the gut and prevent adequate absorption of whatever we give the baby. And of course, an immature renal excretion and absorption further causes loss of calcium and more importantly of phosphorus. So all these factors can and do affect the neonatal bone. We have other risk factors for osteopenia of prematurity, more or less an overlap. So prematurity, very low birth weight, IUGR babies and the IUGR followed by EUGR, that is extra uterine bless you. God bless, my God. Okay, mask up everyone. So it's not only intrauterine growth restriction, but extra uterine growth restriction, which will further add insult to injury. Parental nutrition, we pride as a neonatologist, I pride myself in being able to provide parental nutrition, but it is never total because in our country, it's not just the macronutrients like protein, carbohydrate, and fat, but it's also the minerals which need to be provided. And we are not in a position to completely provide those because RTPNs are made in the NIC. Unlike a pharmacy, which takes over the process of manufacturing the TPN in any other international hospital. So that's a limitation for us. Then, of course, BPD. Bronchopalmy dysplasia is another factor because the treatment of bronchopalmy dysplasia is fluid restriction and diuretics. And diuretics, especially the loop diuretics, will cause hypocalcemia and the thiazides will cause hypercalcemia. Both of these will affect the phosphorus metabolism, thereby leading to osteopenia of maturity. Once again, long term postnatal corticosteroid use. Short gut because of NEC, delayed feeding, feeds that do not have high mineral content. As I explained, that normal milk given to preterm babies is not sufficient in minerals and will definitely further increase the gap in requirement and content. And then we have metabolic or endocrine disorders, which play a small role as far as OOP is concerned. Uh, clinically, we find nothing okay, in the baby. In the first four to five weeks, we find nothing. The only thing we do find is an occasional X-ray chest, which we take if the baby is at BPD or NEC, and you find the flaring. I'll show it to you in the next slide. We find flaring of the ribs. And that is one of the first signs we see as far as osteopenia is concerned. And then you see rarefaction at the epiphyseal ends. And then we start realizing that this baby four to five weeks down the line is now predisposed to osteopenia of prematurity. So diagnosis ultimately will take time and usually noted in infancy rather than in the newborn period. You may have other signs and symptoms which are not so uh, obvious. Craniotabies is not something which we see routinely nowadays. So in the olden days, we've seen a lot of craniotabies. But yes, thickening of wrists, ankles, mildly, we may notice it and confirm it on an X-ray. Growth is very important, hence monitoring these babies after discharge, even for length, weight, is so important that gives us some idea as to what you may be dealing with. If you do blood tests, which normally we don't do, we may do it towards the end, six to eight weeks, but not in the initial part, you find that the alkaline phosphatase is quite elevated in osteopenia. So up to 700 to 800 is considered normal for a growing baby. But if you go 1000 and above, then obviously you're in trouble and you need to analyze this and look for OOP in that situation. Phosphorus is very low. So that is the one thing which gives us a very fair idea that you're dealing with osteopenia of prematurity and you usually don't need other tests. So high alkaline phosphatase, low phosphorus, so bang on the diagnosis. You don't need to do any further tests. Calcium usually is normal or borderline low. X-rays, as I said, incidental findings, specifically doing X-rays would only be when you have a high alkaline phosphatase and you want to confirm what is happening. Otherwise, in neonatal period, you don't need to do exercise. Uh, these supplementary tests we rarely do. So vitamin D levels or 25-hydroxy, unless you're suspecting, 
some inborn error of metabolism of vitamin D. So these are some of the x-rays. So as you can see, the first lot where a baby starts off with what looks like a normal uh, metaphysical end, ultimately lands up with this ragged thing. This usually this transition from here to here takes about two and a half to three months. So you may not be able to pick it up that early. However, what you can see, this is a baby with a stage two BPD. And what you will see is that there'll be gentle flaring absolutely of the rib ends. And that is the first thing. We, we sometimes think that these are actually patches. They're not, they're just flared up um, uh, rib ends. So we, this is the first time you can pick it up. And then when you see laterally, in a very small, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it here, but you start seeing a rarefaction and fraying of the edges. So this is where we start picking up. Dr. Bujang is very good at picking up these small things, which we tend to overlook. Dr. Bujang is uh, our consultant in radiology. So once you have thought about it, confirmed it, or suspected and confirmed the diagnosis, what are the principles of management? Simple providing adequate calcium and phosphorus intake to promote normal bone growth. So prevention is better than cure, definitely. So whether it is TPN, whether it's early enteral nutrition and late enteral nutrition, which requires fortification, all of these need to be thought of to prevent osteopenia of premature. <laughs> Nutritional support during the birth, hospitalization and post-discharge must account. So we need to take that into account as to the potential loss of intrauterine accretion and the postnatal further deficit or depletion because of inadequate supplementation. Surprisingly, vitamin D supplementation for osteopenia of prematurity is quite limited. So giving huge doses of vitamin D is not going to help much, but giving vitamin D, calcium, and adequate phosphorus will not only prevent, but also treat osteopenia of prematurity. Lab monitoring, whenever we suspect, is a good thing to do. And um, for infants who develop rickets, who actually have established osteopenia, provision of supplemental calcium and phosphorus is required to replace and to replenish the deficit. So these are some of the values we see of calcium and phosphorus in different types of milk. So preterm human milk has only 40 milligrams per 100 calories. Um, of milk, uh, 40 milligrams of calcium, and 20 of phosphorus, which is grossly inadequate considering we require 160 to almost 200 milligrams of calcium and roughly half to two thirds of phosphorus. So we definitely need to look at human milk fortification, especially in this population. Or if that is not possible, then infant milk formula, which is specifically made for preterm babies. So in the NICU itself, you want to prevent, a bit too small, I apologize, I want to try to fit it into one slide, but anyway. So we try to prevent osteopenia of prematurity by supplementing sufficient calcium and phosphorus and a bit of vitamin D. So 10 mics roughly comes to about uh, 40, 400 international units of uh, uh, vitamin D. And we keep on checking alkaline phosphatase after a month. If after a month we find that the alkaline phosphatase is very high, which means thousand and above, we are usually dealing with osteopenia of prematurity, in which case we would do an X-ray, confirm the diagnosis and give calcium, phosphorus and vitamin D up to 800 international units a day. We would then check alkaline phosphatase every fortnight and then repeat X-rays at probably six to 12 weeks. And then we take it further. If the alkaline phosphatase is less than a thousand, then we monitor the alkaline phosphatase. If it is increasing 800 and above, possible rickets, we take the first step. If it is stabilizing between the 800 and gradually coming down, and you are supplementing enough calcium and phosphorus and vitamin D, then we can just monitor clinically or once in a while do alkaline phosphatase. If the alkaline phosphatase is less than 800 and definitely going down, and the phosphorus is more than four milligram per dm. In that case, uh, we believe it is very low risk for bone disease. We just monitor and supplement normally. And with that, I stop over here. Remember that 
osteopenia of prematurity is different from normal rickets in the fact that phosphorus is the one you need to supplement. I think that is the one single sentence you need to understand. Phosphorus supplementation, unfortunately, is not so easy. Has anyone used nephrology? Has anyone used phosphorus supplements? We can use IFOS. Uh, anyone else? Anyone has used phosphorus? Added phosphorus? What is the side effect of added phosphorus? This is a big problem for us. Diarrhea. So diarrhea is very profound, very, very profound. We also used to get Julie's solution, which you still get at Dara uh, yeah. the pharmaceutical is an so that's a cheaper version, by the way. Yeah. It has to be commercially prepared. Yes. So each time that makes a fresh match, which can last for a month. So this is some of the important bits. But do remember, it's not only phosphorus, but it is phosphorus, calcium, and a bit of vitamin D. Giving too much of vitamin D will only cause lethargy, fatigue, excessive crying in these babies, and it's not going to help us much. A lot of authorities believe that in preemie, especially less than one kilo, you need to give as much as 1,000 international units of vitamin D daily for at least six months. But I think we do not have sufficient evidence to support that. So probably 400 to 800 should suffice with adequate calcium and phosphorus. Yeah. Thank you. Our next speaker was Dr. Bhujan Parso, who is a senior radiologist at Sir Action Reliant Hospital, will be giving insights into the role of X-ray imaging and bone disease. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Satya and Dr. Rahul Uma, for inviting me for this talk. So, we, the topic for the day basically what was told to me was to discuss something on 
some interesting radiographs of the pediatric bones. And uh, to be very honest, I have a huge collection. Uh, to really pin down a lot of x-rays to show you all some of the very uh, more common ones that we see in day to day practice. And how, as a radiologist, we can help the clinician to come to a diagnosis and therefore help in the treatments. So, this was the first case of a newborn who died shortly after delivery. This was the chest x ray of the baby. Uh, if you look at it, the child has uh, significant dolichocephaly. But when you look at the x ray in detail, uh, which we always tell our students that you look at it from, from top to below, you look at the uh, upper limbs, look at the ribs very carefully, which is very important to display this. And when you look at the femurs, on both sides, you see that there's something very typical which is happening. When you see an appearance like this, in which you see the femora, which are seen as a telephone hoax, it's a spot diagnosis for a thanatophoric dwarfism. So, dysplasias in general are very difficult to diagnose. You have a plethora of uh, so many dysplastic diseases, and one is not expected to know all the dysplasias. It's very difficult to diagnose some of them. But there are some of the common ones which you must know and which are very easy to diagnose and help the clinician. So this is very classical. When you see telephone hook like uh, EMAS, uh, it's a spot diagnosis for thanatophoric dwarfism. Here's a child with hand deformities, and you wonder why I'm showing you an X-ray of the pelvis with both lips. Now, whenever you suspect a display here, there's a clinical information which the clinician gives us that we're suspecting a display there. They usually ask for what is part of the skeletal cell. And you have to be very judicious in asking for what x rays as a radiologist that you will inform the technician to do. Because you must understand that at the background, we are looking at giving high doses of radiation to the child. So you must focus yourself into getting the most relevant x rays in a particular patient. Now, here we have a child who has uh, an x ray of the pelvis with both hips. You can see that uh, I keep a gonadal shield to protect the gonads. But very importantly, when you look at this, uh, the residents diagnosed that this was a femoral fracture involving both the femoral necks. But this is not a fracture of the femur. These are what are called as infantile coxa vara. And when you see infantile coxa vara like this, and very importantly, you see gross dissociation of the pubic symbiosis. Which could look, uh, which could mimic an ectopia vasectomy. So, in a child who has uh, gross dissociation of the pubis symphysis with a bilateral infantile coxa vara, it's a spot diagnosis for pleurocranial dysostosis. Now, this is the same child, and you will see that uh, uh, the clavicles. You may find that the clavicles may be absent. Many a times, the clavicles may be very rudimentary, and when you see small rudimentary clavicles, sometimes hypoplastic, sometimes absent. It's a spot diagnosis for pleurocranial dysostosis. Similarly, in this child, in a child with a pleurocranial dysostosis, given a hand X-ray, you will see that there's an extra ossification center at the base of the second metacarpal, and again, association of a extra ossification center at the base of the second metacarpal is a diagnostic tool to tell you that this is pleurocranial dysostosis. So these are spots, I and mean, when you look at such films. You can definitely say that these are certain particular displays. Again, in this child with the pleurocranial dysostosis, you see multiple unossified bones here, particularly in the occiput, what are known as the vermin bones. And when you see vermin bones with the uh, infantile coxa vara with absent or rudimentary clavicles, it is again diagnostic of pleurocranial dysostosis. This is a seven-month-old child. And we've done X-ray of uh, both the lower limbs. There is subtle increase in the bone density on either side, as well as in the upper limbs. And this is again very diagnostic. So you have a large head, this uh, gross dolichocephaly. But the most important thing is when you sorry.
So when you look at the X-ray, sorry, X-ray of the skull, you will see that uh, there is a rectilinear mandible. If you see the mandible, it is like a rectilinear uh, cutoff mandible. It is uh, lost the mandible angle. And in a child, wherein you see a rectilinear mandible with a large uh, head like this, it is diagnostic for pycnobisostosis. And when you see this uh, child's hands, uh, you will see very typically uh, acroosteolysis up there. And in a child with acroosteolysis and with the uh, rectilinear mandible, you are looking at a case of pycnobisostosis. This is a three year old child with vision loss and anemia. Dense bones, what are classically called as bone within bone appearance or marble bone disease, which is very typical of osteopetrosis. And if you look at it carefully, you will be able to see that the spleen is also enlarged because of the anemia. So, in a child with uh, bone within bone appearance or dense bones or sclerotic uh, dysplasias, one of the first things that you would think of is osteopetrosis. Many a times, because of the chronic anemia, you may get a classical hair on end appearance uh, because of the anemia, and this is one of the hallmarks of osteoporosis. The same patient's uh, hand exchange, which shows dense bones and bone within bone appearance, and showing the lower ends of the femora and the, and the legs. You may also be able to see subtle fractures, and you will see that there are a lot of modeling deformities, what are classically known as the early male class deformities. This is a two year old female with hard muscles on her back and axilla. In fact, when the mother was bathing the child, she noticed that this child had something very hard on her back, and for which she was brought to the uh, hospital and we've done x rays for this child. So when you look at this child's chest x-ray, uh, apparently it looks normal, but you look at it carefully and you'll see something like an ossific mass sitting here on the overlying the right scapula. And there is some subtle ossification which is seen in the left intraaxillary region. So the next thing, when you see something like this, it was usually thought that this was myositis ossificans. But you do an x-ray of That's the ossific mass. And when you do an X-ray of the foot, it's very, very diagnostic. Uh, what you see here is uh, overgrowth of the first metatarsal, what is classically described as a hallux valgus. But most importantly, you see this proximal phalanx of the great toe on both sides, which is like a peg. So when you see peg-shaped phalanges like this, proximal phalanges, you see a hallux valgus. And you see the overgrowth of the heads of the first metatarsal. This is something what is called as fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, which was formerly known as myositis ossificans. This is a child who presented with abnormal finger nails. And again, I'm showing you exterior of the pelvis with both hips. You look at a film like this, you can give a diagnosis straight away. It's a spot diagnosis. Uh, yes, nice. So you see these uh, classical IDEC forms, what are known as the forms lesions, right? There is the absence of the potato, and you'll also see a dislocation of the radial head. So all these form a, a syndrome, what is known as the nail patella syndrome. This is a young male with a funny looking figure. He had a large uh, figure when he presented us with his uh, deformity of the index finger. When you see something like this, a large finger which is overgrown compared to all the other fingers which are normal, this is very typical of macro dystrophia hypomagnesia. So, one of the reasons for this is if this child has neurofibromatosis, it can also be seen in children with fibrous dysplasia, and there is a lot of uh, deposition of lipomatous tissue in the soft tissues. Okay, now this is a 11 year old male with a large head. 
And I don't think you can see anything better than what I'm showing you. You must have all seen this, but this is something really spectacular. Okay, which is uh, classical. What is this called as? What is the canon and appearance of a chronic hemolytic anemia? In this case, it was calcium major. So very classical. Uh, you can't get a better picture than this. And in the same child, if you do a hand x-ray, you will see that the metacarpals are square shaped. There is a diffuse osteopenia. You see cross uh, a coarse or trabecular pattern in all the uh, bones of the hand. Very classical of calcium uh, major. This child presented with anemia and hepatosplenomegaly. And in this patient, uh, you will see a large osteolytic lesion involving the uh, right eyelid bone. You should not miss a smaller lytic lesion here in the proximal femur. You see lytic lesions in the calvarium as well in the skull. This is very, and when you go x ray of the spine, you'll see there is plaque spondyly. So, all these are features of histiocytosis. What you can also get to see with use of clinic diagnosis. This is a young male who presented with heel pain, and obviously the symptom was that he was getting excruciating pain when he was walking. And X-ray of the ankle was asked for along with the lateral view. And when he did the X-ray of the ankle, uh, the lateral view, you can see that there is a large osteolytic lesion which is occupying almost the entire calcium. It has got a lot of septae within it. So the differential diagnosis which were raised was one was whether it's a large simple bone cyst. You can also see this with an aneurysmal bone cyst. But one of the things you should never forget is that you can have this with the pseudo femur of hemophilia. So one of the things that you must always consider in flat bones, when you see a large lytic lesion like this, especially in the calcium or in the pelvic bones, especially in the eyelid bone, uh, one of your differential diagnosis should always be uh, pseudo femur of hemophilia. And pain and swelling, very classical. Using uh, periosteal reactions along the third and the fifth metacarpals. Anyone for a diagnosis? This is the hand foot dactylitis syndrome in patients with sickle cell anemia. So 10 to 20 percent of children with sickle cell disease can present like this, and they can present with uh, excruciating pain due to infarcts in the small tubular bones of hands and feet. In fact, I have films of the abdomen in which you can see infarcts in the lumbar spine, and these are the patients who can present with acute abdominal pain. So one of the things you should never miss is a sickle cell anemia. Okay, some really nice cases, a uh, few of them which I wanted to share with you. This is a young girl with a short stature, and you know it's very evident that the fourth metacarpal is short. And you must know that one of the reasons for a short metacarpal or short fourth metacarpal could be normal. It could be a normal way, provided you rule out all the genetic problems. But in a child who has uh, irregular periods, uh, short fourth metacarpal, one thing that you should always consider would be a Turner syndrome. Okay. Similarly, a short stubby child. Hand x has been given for a diagnosis. It was sent to me for a second of video uh, because somebody labeled this as uh, achondroplasia. But this is not achondroplasia for a simple reason. When you see this X-ray carefully, you'll see that the that the metacarpal uh, proximal ends of the metacarpals are tapering, which is one one of the findings. And very importantly, you can see this slanting ulna and the slant which you see between the ulna and the radius. Is very typical for neuropolysyphrodosis, which is a Perle syndrome. This is a child with precocious puberty. And uh, again, you will see modeling deformities involving the uh, first and second fingers. 
There is a classic ground glass appearance, which you see in the in the shafts of the metacarpals as well as in the phalanges. And in a child with precautious puberty, what you would like to obviously diagnose could be uh, fibrous dysplasia. Okay, and when you examine the child, you see capital lace spots, and therefore this becomes a maternal Albright syndrome. So this child presented with a deformed hand, a lot of soft tissue swellings, some of them pretty hard. And you see large expansile lytic lesions involving the metacarpals, involving the phalanges. Uh, you can see tapering of the lower end of the ulna. This is very classical of obvious disease. Okay, now as I was telling you, there are uh, these spots which you see, which are very diagnostic, and you can definitely give a diagnosis without even offering a definition. And this is one of them. When you see a hand x ray in a child, in whom the pediatrician is suspecting a dysplasia. Uh, one of the X-rays you definitely ask for is a skull X-ray. We'll ask for the hand X-rays and we'll ask for a pelvis with both hips. And when you see a film like this, it's a giveaway, it's a spot diagnosis. You never see in any condition the lunate and the triquitrum fusing like this. So when you see a fusion of the lunate and the triquitrum, it is a spot diagnosis for a chondroectodermal dysplasia. Okay, so whenever you see something like this, you can immediately tell the clinician that you're looking at a chondroitic or dysplasia. Now, in contrast to what we saw, mucopolysaccharidosis, look at this patient's hand. This child's hand, you'll see the metacarpal is almost uniform, almost of the same length, and quite broad. And there's a gross whitening between the thumb and the index finger, which is classically described as a trident hand. And this is where you get to see it in a condoplasia. I think you discussed a lot of metabolic bone today, and this is one of them. So you see widening of the growth plates in the lower ends of the radius and the ulna. And uh, along with that, you also see subperiosteal resorptions in the middle phalanges involving the radial aspects of the index and the middle fingers. And when you see something like this, it is very diagnostic of a hyperparathyroid. So, following chronic uh, renal disease, this child also has developed hyperparathyroid. Okay. So, very rare, but all of us have read about it. We all know about it. When there is premature rupture of the amnion, the fetal parts can get entrapped within the amniotic fluid. And it's very classical when you see such traumatic amputations of the phalanges. Okay, this is very classical of the amniotic band syndrome. No marks for diagnosis, very straightforward. You see this uh, widening of the growth plates, there is fraying, there is cupping. Again, very diagnostic of uh, rickets. Uh, this child was uh, sent to me for a second opinion uh, at uh, the Indira Hospital. So they were actually going through a lot of blood tests to check whether this patient had a malignancy. And this is what the X-ray was, which I took at the hospital. And very classical, I don't think it's even better than a book picture, what you see here. This is scurry, okay? And you see all the features of scurry. You can see the Wimberger sign. You can't see it better than this. You can see the Wimberger sign. You can see the falcon spurs. And look at this. There's a large subperiosteal hematoma which is calcified. Very classical of scurvy. This is a magnified view. You can even see the uh, periosteum being lifted up. And there's a large subperiosteal collection which has got calcified. Another spot diagnosis. You look at it once, you will never forget it. There is no, no differential for this. When you see such dense metaphysical sclerosis in the lower ends of the femur, and in the proximal tibia, you tend to start giving differential diagnosis, which is but natural. One of them might be a yield rickets. But when you look at this x a little more carefully, you will see that there is sclerosis in the fibular heads. And when you see sclerosis in the fibular heads, along with metaphysical sclerosis, it's a spot diagnosis for lead poisoning. Okay. So this is very, very classic of lead poisoning. I thought I must share this with you all. This was an infant with deformed joints. 
I promised Dr. Kiran Sir I will show you this film. So this was the incident which was sent to us uh, for the second opinion. And uh, when you see this child's X-ray, uh, you'll see that uh, there are deformities in the in the uh, proximal lens of the uterus on either side. You see something like peg shaped defects. So therefore, I have taken a magnified view to show that. And look at the skull. It's as if it is devoid of a skull bone completely. There is absolute absence of bone. And when you see this, almost like a bald skull without a, uh, actually a skull warrant or bone there, it is a very typical diagnosis or diagnostic of hypophosphatase. Okay. And these are the child's uh, lower limbs. You, it mimics vitamin D uh, rickets. It can mimic the uh, lactic uh, deformity, but you must bear this in mind. Steroid absence of uh, complete demineralization, the absence of the abdomen phosphatase, very classic of hypophosphatase. This also came to me for a second opinion. Three month old child with fever and irritability. And I was telling a resident how you should, how you should look at a patient who comes to the hospital. It is not that they come here for entertainment. You must understand there's a child who's suffering. You must also understand that their parents are very anxious. And it is up to us to allay their anxiety and put them at ease and tell them that this is what it is. Now, this child was going from pillar to post, was extremely irritable, had a high grade fever, and was crying all the time. And the chest extreme which was given to me was actually a giveaway. If you look at the if you look at the ribs here on the right side, okay, you will see they are all crowded and they are quite thickened there. Okay, there's quite a lot of sclerosis and thickening of the ribs. It is the hand extreme, and you'll see a lot of cortical thickening, very cortical thickening along the radius and the ulna, predominantly on the left side. I did an extreme of the limbs, lower limbs, and you can see cortical thickening along the tibia as well on the right side. And this is actually the most diagnostic uh, picture that you could see. You can't see anything better than this. When you see thickening just beneath the mandible on either side, it is a spot diagnosis for infantile cortical hyperostosis, also known as Caffey's disease. Okay. So in Caffey's disease, all that you need to do is just reassure the parents. This is a self-limiting disease. It will settle down. But unless you know about it, unless you've seen it, you really cannot explain to these patients. So in fact, in the MD radiology exams, I would keep only this slide, and you are expected to give a diagnosis of a Caffey's disease. It is that classical. This was a two month old with the hepatosplenomegaly. And again, very typical. You know, if you look at this uh, same patient's x ray, you'll see all the features that you would like to see epiphysitis, metaphysitis, diaphysitis. You can see a big erosion here in the proximal tibia. Very classical of congenital syphilis. Okay, so all the features that you see in congenital syphilis in the bones are seen in this particular film. This child presented with joint swelling, and here is a teaching point. I mean, you look at this child's spine, cervical spine. The child has kept the spine in flexion. There is a lot of paraspinal spasm, but very importantly, you see that all the facet joints are completely ankylosed and sclerosed. Okay. And there is a big craniovertebral anomaly. There is a big atlantoaxial dislocation. So when you see a child with atlantoaxial dislocation and facet ankylosis, it is a spot diagnosis again for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And that is the way you diagnose a juvenile arthritis, uh, rheumatoid because they are the ones who are more prone to having facet ankylosis and atlantoaxial dislocations. Okay. Okay, now this child was again interesting, unfortunately, but uh, the five month old infant admitted in coma uh, came to me for a review of the x rays. And this was the x ray which was first shown to me and because this was the x ray that they were carrying. And it was reported normal, but there's something much, much more than that. If you look at it carefully, uh, you will see that I'm showing you a MAC view. You see that there is a corner fracture of the metaphysis. The minute you see a metaphysical corner fracture, you got your diagnosis. This is non accidental injury or non accidental trauma, also what is commonly known as meta, uh, battered baby syndrome. You look at it a little more carefully and you'll see there is a metaphysical corner fracture here as well in the lower end of the femur. They were not convinced. I mean, when we were discussing in the clinics, so then I said, okay, we'll do some more x rays. And this gave them 
diagnosis straight away. When you look at rib fractures, multiple rib fractures, very importantly in different phases of healing, there are certain fractures which are acute, some of them are chronic. When you see fractures of the ribs bilaterally in different phases of healing, your diagnosis is a non accidental injury. And this is the last slide. Uh, I couldn't help but resist to show you all. It, it is very rare. You almost have read about it. I got to see this uh, only last year. And this was sent to me by my, uh, by my resident who was in the hospital for the sick kids. Uh, he said that, uh, could you diagnose this for us? And, you know, if you see this uh, patient's hand, it is quite grotesque. It is quite, it is markedly deformed. You are seeing a lot of lattice-like uh, trabecular network uh, in the medialized bones. There is deformity of the index and many fingers are swollen. Uh, and when you look at something like this, this is a diagnostic uh, radiograph of a Proteus syndrome. I'm sure you all must have read about it or you will be knowing about it. It is a syndrome which is seen in children, uh, rather very fatal. A lot of proteinaceous deposits, lipomatous deposits, which are you know, deposited in the tongue, in the pharynx, in the hands, and uh, derived from the name Proteus, which was a C Greek god who had disfigured joints. So this is a Proteus syndrome. I had seen it, so I said I must share it with you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions for sir? Thank you, sir. Our last speaker for the day is Dr. Shivsam Jarkote, sir, who is a consultant radiologist at Sir HM Reliance Hospital, will be talking about the role of DEXA scan in children. Am I audible? Clear? Yeah. yeah. Uh, outside, I must thank uh, organizers, including Kiran sir, Rahul sir, and Patel Pai sir for giving this opportunity. Uh, today, we are discussing the uh, role of DEXA scan in the assessment of bone health in children. Uh, there will be top six points in which we will discuss what are the indications for the exa, what are the key factors which we need to do in a patient preparation, what is the scanning technique, how do you interpret it, and how do you follow up with the exa, and what are the limitations alternative to the exa. So, why do we need to do this? Because once we see this particular growth chart, you see the maximum bone mass is achieved by the end of puberty, by the second and third decade. So any insert which is happening in this period will cause a detrimental effects in the older age because the bone mass doesn't go further. So what is DEXA? Uh, D, uh, if you see, I have put the spelling as DXA. Everyone is habituated in writing DEXA instead of DXA. The preferred terminology is DXA rather than DEXA. 
So DEX or DEX stands for dual energy X-ray absorption unity. So this is basically an X-ray based technique. So what, what is dual energy? If dual energy is basically there are two different X-ray energy beams which are being used, which helps us in differentiating two different materials of the different bond density. And this is the still considered as a current gold standard in assessment of the pediatric bone health. So we have seen so many excess by the end of this time. Even after seeing so many excess, I'm sure you won't be, it's not easy thing to differentiate between these two excess, one which is absolutely normal and second which is completely abnormal, more or less of same age group. This is because it's very subjective. For assessment of the bone mineral density, oh sorry, assessment of bone mineral density on a standard area, you need to be an expert. In the moment you come with expertise, it becomes very subjective and becomes less sensitive if you, you are not particularly an expert. And to have the changes on X-ray, standard X-ray, you need to have at least 20 to 40 percent bone loss. And imagine how much bone loss is needed to see these particular changes of altered bone mineral density on a standard extent. And second thing, you need to have so many, uh, so many X-rays of particular body parts to have comparison. This creates a lot of radiation loss. In particular, parents are being very sensitive about the radiation risk. So what are the general goals of bone density metry? First, first and foremost, you want to identify the children which are at risk of skeletal fragility. Second, you want to help uh, things which help in the mind management in terms of guiding treatment and third you want to follow up the patient after the therapy so these are the host of dis uh, disorders which are associated with low bone mass which can include a primary or secondary disorder i'm not going to read through these disorders i'm sure by this time we have gone through most of these so uh, these are the certain clinical indications in which we perform the extra one first what we have seen just before is the osteopenia on conventional radiograph. The moment you see osteopenia, you are seeing almost 20 to 40% of bone is already gone. Uh, patient clinically significant fracture history. So what do we mean by clinically significant fracture history? Because uh, we know kids are like superman, they keep on jumping here and there, and they end up in getting fractures. Almost 30 to 50% of kids get fractures by age of 30 to 50, uh, by age of 19 years. And not all the fractures are clinically significant in terms of the lower bone density. So what constitutes a significant clinical fracture is either a vertebral compression fracture, two or more long bone fractures by age of 10 years, three or more long bone fractures by age of 19 years. There will be certain chronic disorders which will affect the bone mineral density and fourth is to monitor the therapy which has been instituted for the treatment. Uh, these are the expert recommendations in which you perform the when you perform the DEXA. These are for mainly for thalassemia measures, cystic fibrosis, cancer survivors, and inflammatory bowel disease. I'm stopping at this slide. You can take a screenshot because I'm not going to read through. This is what you're not going to remember even after sorry, two, three times. So what I covered only there are three or uh, four five disorders which for which there are standard recommendations, but there are multiple disorders in which there are no standard recommendations. Here it comes the clinical judgment. And this clinical judgment is helpful in deciding which patient needs DEXA because that is where you decide whether this patient is at risk of skeletal fragility or not. So what are the special things which you need to do before performing DEXA scan? So first and foremost, it is a daycare procedure. It doesn't take longer time, more than 15 to 20 minutes. On the day of appointment, usually uh, we ask them not to take any vitamin D or calcium. This is the thing which you avoid, particularly if patient is on treatment. Second thing, you need to ask about the history of any Fanta study, which can be a barium, CT, or MRI Fanta study, because these are the things which can hamper with the radiographic density and that can alter uh, the interpretation. So the minimal interval duration, which has been suggested, is at least seven days between the two studies. Uh, this is how a DEXA machine looks. Once the patient goes on scanner, this is a table. This is the X-ray source and this is the detector. So X-ray source pass through the patient and these are detected at the level of detector. 
So once patient is in a scanner, what are the areas you want to scan? There are two preferred sites. One is lumbar spine, the second is total body laser. So I'll go through this in lumbar spine. The preferred bones are L1 to L4, and this total body laser is also included. Why these two sites have been selected? Because you have bones everywhere. The main purpose of doing this is accuracy and reproducibility. Because if you want to scan the same area, the identical landmarks are much more easier for these bones rather than any part of the spine. And second thing, why total body? Why not? Uh, why total body laser? Why not? Only total body, because if you know the head is one such part which is less affected by environmental and nutritional disorders. So, and the head almost occupies forty percent of the total body mass. If you include the head, that can grossly over or under underestimate the measurements. So, we avoid the head, and additionally, the head fractures are not considered osteoporotic fractures. Uh, does uh, inclusion of both the bones, uh, both the parts? Use some advantage. Yes, lumbar spine. As you know, spine is composed of the trabecular bone, while total body less head is composed of the cortical bone. So, if you include the trabecular bone, you know trabecular bone is affected more in the metabolic disorders and the hypogonadism. While the cortical bone, which is come, which is the dominant component of the total body less head, is affected in patients with thyroid, hyperparathyroid, and low hormone disorders. So besides these two standard sites, there are alternative sites where you can obtain, but these are the sites not commonly obtained. There are special needs in which these things are obtained. One of them is lateral distal tumor. This is particularly obtained in patients who cannot be mobilized, particularly with the immobilization disorders, those who have spine deformity or contractures. The proximal femur assessment is not as common thing which is done because the hip measurements below 13 years are not considered very standard, unlike adults, because you can't obtain the consistent regions of interest. And proximal femur assessment is usually done in the late after 13 years. And when you want to expect, expect that treatment is going to continue beyond the puberty and beyond the 19 years of age, and the same thing will be assessed over a period of long term. Third side is distal radius. This is the site which is not commonly performed, but you can perform when patient rest of the sites cannot be uh, included because particularly in spine, patient who would treat it or uh, fractures we have that can lead the metallic artifact and that metallic artifact can hamper the evaluation. So after doing all the hard work, you end up getting these color coded maps on the DEXA report. The moment we see three, four pages of the DEXA report, everyone gets lost. So if you want to interpret, there are certain key things. The first thing is the lumbar spine, which is L1 to L4. These are the regions of interest based on which the data is obtained. Second thing is total body laser. You can see the head has been excluded in the measurement. And this is the total body laser based on which BMD measurements has been performed. These are the how uh, we end up in giving the reports. This is the how interpretation of data is done. So I just highlight the key points which are helpful in the interpretation. What you obtain with the PMD is bone mineral handling, which expresses in terms of grams. So this gram value we can uh, express in terms of either area or volume. So aerial BMD, if you have seen the reports of BMD, they mentioned A BMD or aerial BMD. It's basically it's a bone mineral content per unit of area. For volumetric BMD is bone mineral content per cubic centimeter. And what, once you obtain this value, a single number doesn't have any significance unless until you compare with the standard reference population. So what is standard reference population is usually age and sex match. There are certain modifications which also needs to be done in standard population data, which will, I'll discuss further. And based on that, you need to uh, obtain a Z score, which is basically a standard deviation score. So Z score is obtained by uh, my, this formula, which is the observed value, which is basically a patient's value minus mean value upon standard deviation. This is the G score or Z score. And in our old, old good PSM days, we have seen this bell curve of standard deviation. If you see this curve on two standard deviation on either side from the mean, this is the mean, two standard deviation from either side, you obtain 95% confidence level. So, when you're interpreting that particular data, you're sure you're obtaining 90%. Uh, specificity and any value which is 
minus two below minus two or below is considered abnormal. Uh, as we saw just before, uh, most of the data is standardized for the age and sex, but we know the bone mineral density not just depends on these two factors. There are certain factors like body size, ethnicity, pubertal staging, and skeletal maturity can badly affect the bone mineral density. In such cases, you need to do certain adjustment. So, patient with short stature, patient with growth delay or puberty delay, these data has to be adjusted in terms of the absolute height or height age. Just not just with the age or sex specific standard deviation scores. So once you obtain data, how you interpret it? So in others, once we obtain Z score and T score, you can confidently say this is osteoporosis. But the diagnosis of osteoporosis in children and adolescents is not done just based on bone density metric criteria. What you need to have as per the 2013 consensus IS, ISCD, uh, you need to have one or more uh, vertebral compression factor in absence of local disease or in absence of high energy trauma that constitutes osteoporosis in pediatric patient or in absence of vertebral compression factor you need to have combination of a low bmd score which is basically minus two or below and you need to have clinically significant factor which are again defined as two or more fractures below by the age of 10 years or three or more bone fractures by age of 19 years Remember what we saw, the score of minus 2 and below is usually considered low, but the score above minus 2 does not conclusively uh, exclude the possibility of skeletal fragility. That's the, one of the major limitations of the BMD. Uh, in older days, the T-score was mentioned in the pediatric BMD scores also. But remember the T-score should never appear in the pediatric BMD course because the T-score is where you compare the patient's BMD with that of healthy younger adult. That comparison is not usually done for the pediatric patient. Second thing, you should not use term osteoporosis using the adult BMD. Third thing, the osteoporosis is clinical diagnosis, which should be supplemented with the BMD data. So the osteoporosis is used only when there's a clinically significant factor issue with low BMD score. So this is what a preferred terminology is. When you see a BMD score of minus two or below, you term that as a low bone mass for chronology place. You don't interpret that as an osteoporosis. So how do you follow up with the exam? Once you have seen the patient, you instituted treatment or you want to do a follow up. Unlike CT and MRI, the follow up has to be done on the same equipment same model and preferably same software version. This is because there is cross discrepancies in many times because of the different technologies, acquisition techniques and the reference database has been used by different manufacturers. Even the same manufacturer, if you're using two different machines, the data can get uh, widely varied. How much, how frequently you can do BMD? The minimum interval is supposed to be six months, preferably it's one year. You cannot do BMD less than six months because the meaningful changes in BMD don't happen below six months. And usually the paper duration is one year. At times you can delay it for two years, three years, depending on the clinical needs. So these are the standard contents of the BMD report, which are supposed to be reported. So what is the limitation of BMD? What I said at the start of the talk, it is a gold standard but there are certain limitations with BMD. One of the major limitations is a two-dimensional thing. Why is two-dimensional? You can, can't take a third dimension because the third dimension is occupied by the exit. So third dimension is not taken in consideration. That can lead to the inherent errors in the assessment. So to take consideration of third dimension, there has been certain formulas which have been used. But there's no one standardized formula. And what is the right formula? That remains a matter of controversy. Uh, what are the alternatives available for DEXA? Uh, there are uh, QCT, which is quantitative CT. You can obtain peripheral quantitative CT, the quantity of ultrasound and MRI. So why would we, why we are not using the rest of the things? Why are we still stuck with the DEXA? Because the rest of the things are not widely available and the references for them are not still widely available. Uh, these are the key papers from which the guidelines have been obtained. 
those have been obtained in 2007, 2013, and 2019. These are all based on the International Society of Clinical Instrument. And you can go through it. Thank you. Uh, it depends on the data which you have. Usually, the standardized data is not available below three years. So most of the three years, in some in some machines, it is not below five years or so. You can obtain a BMD, but you are not able to interpret with the reference population. And second thing, if you are obtaining biomistic, if you end up in obtaining, you need to use that as a baseline data. And over a period of time, that first data which you have obtained, that serves as a baseline for the patient and you interpret whether the change is in positive or negative. We have final discussion by Dr. Rajan Unaskar, Senior Pediatrician at Sir HN Reliance Hospital, Dr. Vinit Sandhani, Pediatrician at Sir HN Reliance Hospital, Dr. Bhakteshri Kapoor, Pediatric Dentist at Sir HN Reliance Hospital. Dr. Ranjit Targarka, Pediatric Nephrologist at INS Ashwini, Dr. Mandar Abashi, Pediatric Orthopedic Surgeon at SRCG, moderated by Dr. Preeti Nandar Ma, uh, Senior Pediatric Nephrologist at DY Patel. Good evening, everybody, and it's indeed heartening to see many people as Dr. Kerat rightly pointed. And <laughs> yeah, that's a very nice uh, thing to do. <laughs> okay, most of the things are have been discussed. So right now we'll quickly run through and just assimilate everything we have learned and gain uh, the pulse of wisdom from our eminent the faculty. Um, Uh, so I'll just quickly go. Uh, most of the things have been discussed. So let us just uh, uh, quickly go to a common case scenario which we see daily in our uh, OPD practice, or you know when we see a child for who has come for immunization. So this is a 16 month old male child. There are parental concerns about bowing of legs. The child is developmentally normal. The length of the child is normal. There is no other bony deformity. Our parents are quite worried about this bow legs. So is it rickets or not rickets? Uh, can I put the first question to Dr. Rajan Inadak, sir? Now, as regards the blood test, as regards the blood test, to relieve the anxiety of the parents, I think it's worth doing it to label it. Okay. Regarding doing the x ray, I think you have to explain to them that this is a part of normal uh, physiological genuine. And only thing in cases where it is very severe, it is progressive. Or it persists beyond two and a half to three years of age that you require to do an x ray. As Dr. Kinney had already shown us, okay, how over a period of time they revert to normal by the time they, the toddlers, is going to be part of the Correct, sir. 
So uh, can I uh, request Dr. Vinit sir to uh, take the second question? How will we monitor this child? How are you going to follow up this child? Uh, and how long uh, are you going to follow up this child? How old is the age of the child? Sixteen months, sir. So uh, normally, it seems to be a physiological void. So what happens is until two years, you can wait and not do anything. If it is physiological bowing, and usually once the child starts walking, this bowing will get corrected. And as Dr. Keeney has said, it would get ideally corrected close to seven years, where it would change from uh, the minute the child walks. So you don't need to do anything, but yes, monitoring should happen post two years in case there is asymmetry or the deformity is increasing or it is persisting or there is limping on one side. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, can I request Dr. Mandar to take on the third and the fourth question? And how are we going to counsel the parents? And which are the red flag signs when we know that this is pathological? Now, no, no longer we want to have to monitor; we have to act. Yeah. So, can I also take the first question? Sure, 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 sure. So, so uh, the thing is, I'm so I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I look at X-rays, I look at MRIs, and I do all of this. And the X-ray which I do is a both low limb AP X-ray. The reason is twofold. One is that the parents have come for a deformity of the limbs, which a pair keda hai. So they are always allayed if the fear are always allayed if I take an X-ray of the part which is affected. That is one thing. Secondly, uh, I think there are no more guidelines where, where any limping child, any child is associated with the lower limb issue. It is better that you get an X-ray. Where you can also screen the hips also. There are many times where a child comes with an abnormal gait and you have missed, you have missed a developmental dysplasia very upstairs. So, my take is I always get an x ray done. I, if there are no signs of rickets, if the x ray is absolutely clean and there is no sign of rickets, I will not do a blood test because uh, I mean, it's not going to change my management. I will monitor the child. I say that at one and a half years, it's going to correct by around two and a half years or so. I always give a leeway to myself and to the parent that at least eight years will be also okay for them. As often said, I always ask them to take photos and keep them with them. Okay. Uh, uh, I always, I in fact have a series of photos in in on my computer that I have checked, told them that this is at three months, this is six months, this is at and at two and a half years it's straightened. I also counsel them that it is going to go a child with four legs at this age is going to go to knock knees at three years. And four years. So it is a natural progression. What they say, is what I say. All right. The other pathological thing is that if there are cross signs of it, which is unilateral. And the one thing which uh, uh, clinically I think everyone should do is something known as a cover test. So uh, cover test is one thing that you cover the lower part of the leg and you see whether there is a cross deformity in the upper leg. Now, upper tibial deformity is always pathological. So, these are the things which we look for as red flags. Can I just ask another question to that? Yes. Uh, when, when it comes to taking an x ray, would you uh, insist on a weight bearing x ray? Yeah. So, getting a, getting a lying down x ray is difficult enough. Getting a standing x ray in a year and a half child is impossible. So, I get a lower limb. AP X ray lying down, probably two people catching him, but get an X ray done. Get an X ray right from the hip to, to whatever part is available and get an X ray done. Okay, thank you so much. So, summarizing for this child, uh, as uh, our, our orthopedician uh, has said, that get an X ray done, pediatrician might be a little. Uh, uh, they are wary about doing an X ray, but uh, certainly we'll do a blood test and so that we can supplement vitamin D if it is this. We'll monitor the child till two years of age and we will uh, look for any red flag signs. Coming to the next uh, case, she's a three year old child who was presented with short stature, bony deformity with wrist tightening, knock knees, and the uh, short stature, of course. And a younger sibling has similar bony deformity. Uh, and I'd like to ask Dr. Ranji, what are the additional history points which you will ask to say that this is a, a non nutritional record? So, where vitamin D is not the primary cause. So, uh, firstly, uh, in this history itself, the presence of short stature, the presence of another a sibling with a similar problem does point towards a non nutritional cause. 
In addition, we would also uh, to complete the history, look for the hemolytic in the parent, look for any stigmata of renal tubular disorders like polyuria, polydipsia, salt craving, maybe getting up in the night. Uh, sometimes in the night time, the child is going in for, uh, 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 I think I'm forgetting the name, necrolox uh, sometimes we can also find uh, stigmata which are extra osseous, uh, as was described, uh, alopecia, uh, cataracts, intellectual disability. They can be features of the renal calcaneal syndrome. Uh, so these are these are some of the features we would like to look for. And if in doubt, and if they are in the territory where we can't investigate, in the good old days, we used to give a dose of vitamin D for half the patient. So, uh, very crucial. So, this is something the postgraduates should uh, uh, take their notes down. That these are the red flag signs, as we mentioned, and Sir pointed out, where you have to ask these questions specifically and then rule out non nutritional cause of rickets before jumping to giving up. Yes, of course, we have to give vitamin D, but we need to rule out other cause of history itself. Uh, the case to continue is the same thing. Uh, continue, what are the in essential initial investigations uh, which would be required? And I like Dr. Vinit to take this question. So, I explain this. Um, for parathyroid hormone or EB3, electrolytes, creatinine, or uh, saving calcium, phosphorus, alkaline, phosphorase, and pH. Yeah, so surely that summarizes the first line of investigation. Uh, uh, Dr. Mandai, you are nodding. Uh, do you have anything else no, to add? I'm nodding everything. Then, okay, okay, fine. No, I thought you have something there are, else. There are, there, are two, there are two or three which are in the syllabus and two or three which are out. Okay, so, fine. Can I make one small yes, sir, yes, sir. I, I found this problem with my postgraduate. What they see is they see a little bit of puffing of the rest in the OPD. They order vitamin D, 25 hours of vitamin D. They don't go through the other investigation and they see that we diagnose tickets. Then they correct the vitamin D, they measure it again, they say we treat it again. So, this is something which you know we have to be careful about. Yeah. So, vitamin D can be concomitant with any other. Vitamin D is a very common nutritional deficiency, and RDA child can be vitamin D deficient, and hypophosphatic child can be vitamin D. A post lockdown child can be vitamin D. <laughs> Absolutely. A post lockdown child can be vitamin D deficient. So, uh, don't just do vitamin D. The key point is we have to summarize it. We have to do all these first line investigations. Uh, now, I'll just read out the uh, uh, investigation, the calcium was 8.7, phosphorus 3.5, alkaline phosphorus 685, PTH came to be 165, vitamin D was low, 4, creatinine was normal, uh, by, pH was normal, by curve was 20. I'll ask uh, Dr. Rajin sir to, if you like to do, uh, consider it as nutritional requests or do you want to still further evaluate? This will be nutritional requests. The calcium is low normal. Phosphorus is on the lower side, higher alkaline phosphatase, PTH is on the higher side, low vitamin D, creatine is normal, and the blood gases are normal. So there is no need for further evaluation. Okay, sir, fair enough. So this was indeed a case of nutritional rickets. Both siblings were quite uh, deficient in vitamin D, and we have treated uh, uh, we were we thought of treating with vitamin D. I like uh, Doctor, we need to take off the first two questions. What are the regimens of vitamin D? Would you recommend oral, parenteral? What is the dose, duration, and uh, if it was an infant, what kind of supplementation uh, would you have liked? So, uh, oral supplementation is very superior than parenteral supplementation, as it rapidly uh, restores the vitamin D levels. But nonetheless, parenteral also needs to be considered if there is non-compliance or a large dose of vitamin D that needs to be administered or the patient is suffering from any malabsorption in the eye syndrome. The dose, the dose we divide into preventive and treatment, where the treatment, the preventive would be around 400 IU per day under one year and then 600 IU from one year onwards and uh, under 18 years. And for the same, the treatment and written in premature between 800 to 1000 IU and neonates 2000 IU a day. And uh, one, maybe one month to one year is 2000, and one year to 18 years is 3000 to 6000. Now, if you want to be, if you want to treat with a large dose, it's 60,000 units per week for six weeks. 
uh, 60,000 units a week for six weeks. You give it, you measure the levels post three months, but once you finish the 60,000 units over six weeks, then you must also give them a daily vitamin D or preventive supplementation that continues. I just have a question popped in my mind, Dr. Renji. How many times have you seen a nephrocalcinosis uh, post a mega single dose of six lakhs uh, of vitamin D? Totally no, but uh, not very often. But we've seen many of these children who had resisted tickets who were treated with more than uh, one dose. I think they got uh, more about two portions of drugs. That means 60,000 BG for 10 doses. And repeated another time, and they came in with that stone. So, uh, uh, the key point is this is the uh, new uh, guidelines of IAP for vitamin D supplementation. And uh, as uh, Dr. Ranjit says, if we are going to give massive doses of recur uh, recurrent vitamin D to resistant tickets, then we are going to land up in triple A nephrocalcinosis. And then how frequently, can you just take the third question of how frequently should we monitor and by what method should we monitor healing as you might be also be doing in your CKD children. How do you monitor healing once you are given vitamin D or given uh, this, how do you monitor healing? Uh, if it is nutritional rickets and we are very sure of the compliance of the patient, usually an x-ray somewhere around 3 to 4 weeks later will show us a bone of prolific calcification and that itself should indicate that it's, uh, it's uh, healing. Uh, largely, I don't, re I don't repeat uh, the biochemical parameters or even uh, the X-rays very often. It's only once in a while when we feel that the compliance is doubtful, uh, at that time we will repeat it more. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mandal, can you just uh, take the third and the fourth uh, question by orthopedic point of view? So, um, I absolutely agree with sir that I always take an X-ray at around three to four weeks. Uh, I tell them that, that the deformity is not going to correct at three weeks. It's just that we should know that whatever vitamin D we are giving orally, it is reaching the place where it should reach. So cement come here building mein, cement cut truck, building the pocha. It may building sida on a time. So that is the thing which I always say. Uh, the deformity that requires a lot of time to correct. Usually, what is a general parameter, the first three years is a time of virus, three to six years is a time of virus. If it is anything other than that, if the child is a genuine malcolm at one and a half years, it is abnormal, it may not correct, correct completely. If the child has virus at four years, it may not correct completely. So, I am always a bit guarded when this is a scenario where I say that this deformity may not correct completely, we will wait for a year. If it is does not correcting, it is not correcting, then we may have to do a surgery. So I always say that it takes at least one year for bony correction. And if not, you should be ready for the surgery. Fair enough. So the key point is we have to wait for a year or so before we really take up the child under other uh, for the surgery. So uh, this is uh, our uh, next case. It's a four-year-old uh, male child with florid bony deformity, recurrent fractures. There is severe failure to thrive in stunting. History of polyuria, polydipsia, and has received multiple doses of vitamin D. Has already visited. So now, how to evaluate this person? I'll ask. I like Dr. Rajan to take up this case as a pediatrician. How will you further evaluate this case? That calcium, calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphorus, vitamin D. PTH level, blood gases, and of course, ultrasound abdominal images discuss about natural calcium. Yes, thank you, sir. So, yes, in addition to the first line investigation, we said we also have to do certain additional investigations. So, in this case, the vitamin D was 13.5 still on the lower side, PTH was 588, sodium 128, potassium 2.9. Chloride 100, BUN was 16, CREAT was 0.4. I'm just reading out the investigations uh, loud. Calcium 9.7, phosphorus 2.7, alkaline phosphatase 159, pH was 7.25, BICA 14, and PCO2 35. And UHG suggestive of nephrocalcinosis. So I'll ask uh, Dr. Uh, Ranjit sir to please take uh, how, the question how do you have a basic approach to a child with a non nutritional rickets? So, uh, there are many algorithms. Dr. Kiran has showed a very nice algorithm. Uh, the one which we, which was published in uh, you know, the, the protocols in pediatric methodology was to go by phosphate first. So, if phosphate is elevated, usually UGF-KTM would also be elevated and it goes towards CKD. 
If it's not elevated, then we can go by drag gas. If it is acid loaded, then we can go towards a renewable acidosis. Usually, the distal RTA will travel more frequently. Sometimes, uh, isolated proximal RTA is quite rare, it will be associated with uh, the renal pancreas syndrome. But if uh, it is a normal drag gas, then we look at PTH again. If the PTH is normal, then we are looking at hypo, I mean, the phosphate losing liquids. And if the PTH is high, the vitamin D resistance. Thank you, sir. Thanks for really simplifying this. So, I'll again uh, summarize. If it uh, see the serum phosphate first, if it is high, refer to Dr. Uh, Ranjit, sir. If it is uh, uh, <laughs> low, do a blood pH. Uh, if it is showing acidosis, yeah, again refer to him. <laughs> if it is a normal pH, then refer to Dr. Uh, the endocrinologist who gave us such a wonderful talk. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, 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 Correct. So after the uh, primary treatment, you will still supplement uh, them with vitamin D because they are all likely to be vitamin D deficient. But after correction of the primary therapy, thank you, sir. So, so we, we have taken our areas. <laughs> uh, so case four. Uh, this eleven-year-old child. Uh, with genomalgam exaggerated since the past three years. There's a breast widening, rectic rosary, short stature, but there are no other history of polyuria politics or any of the red flag signs we mentioned. Calcium was 7.8, phosphorus 3.7, alkaline phosphate is 900, vitamin D 6.2, PTH 698, creats and everything was normal. So my question to Dr. Ja, uh, with order to minutes and will will then nutritional rickets can cause such severe deformity in adolescent age group because commonly we say rickets is the disease in toddlers. So we have not seen nutritional rickets causing such deformity in adolescents. So possibly if it is so, then it may be an undefeated or missed or nutritional rickets which is gone in for so long. Or then you need to rule out other causes because there is a component of short stature also in the child. So then you must look into the other causes that can cause such loss deformity and adolescent, which may be a skeletal dysplasia or a few sort of things. Yes. So uh, uh, can Dr. Mandar take the next two question? Is orthopedic correction required immediately? And if we are given vitamin D, how long to wait? I mean, how long before? Because this patient we was admitted under orthopedic uh, ward and we had gone for a fitness of surgery. And that is how we picked up that is vitamin D deficient. So, so, um, so this child will require surgery sometime or the other. There's no doubt. This is not normally treated by the one thing. Secondly, now when is orthopedic correction required? Now, when there is such a cross deformity, I look at a, a picture where it is usually a nutritional picture or a non nutritional, some sort of secondary case, which is not in syllabus for us. So, so uh, if it is nutritional, I go ahead with surgery. I don't wait for the, the metabolic parameters to become normal because that's going to take a long time. The surgery here is a very very small benign surgery, which is the growth modulation, which uh, is not much dependent on the bone strength for the plates to hold, it just acts mechanically on its own. If it is some form of non-nutritional rickets, I will not touch the child till the, the, all the parameters are normal. I have burned my, my fingers in the past where I was very enthusiastic, the RB deformity has is corrected. But in renal liquid, especially, it just doesn't correct. So, if it is non nutritional, allow everything to settle down. If then I have to do the child is past skeletal maturity and I have to go for an osteotomy, then leave. But don't touch a child with non nutritional till the time is completely metabolically correct. So, that is my. 
flare it up. So if a child is having a non-nutritional rickets, then not to correct surgically till the primary cause is corrected. If it is nutritional and with such severe deformity, we can go ahead without any time lag between vitamin D dose, without any time lag between the that vitamin D dose. That can go on simultaneously. That correction can go on Okay, So without any correction, we can go ahead. Uh, so a last part, we have uh, uh, Dr. Madhvishri with us, and uh, I think it's she's been silent for so long. Yeah. I request her to speak up. So what are the common dental issues in children with rickets? The most common one that I get reported from the rehabilitation aspect is dental abscess and uh, periodontal abscess. As a dentist's perspective, we see that there is a uh, dentine uh, defect in the dentine and the enamel. The pulp chamber, which is uh, the center part of the tooth, that's very large. The horns of those pulps are very enlarged. So that's the reason these are one of the common mistakes which leads to failure. So those are one of the common dental issues that we come across. And uh, does vitamin D deficiency predispose to dental care? Yes, a big yes. So uh, firstly, uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, affects the cellular function, which is your bum. And uh, if there is any kind of uh, poor gum health issues, that will be disposed to dental care. Apart from that, uh, vitamin D does, we all know that plays a very important role uh, for bone and tooth mineralization. Uh, mineralization. So uh, there are hypomineralized dentine, which is, leads to highly susceptible fracture, decay, and hence the case. And uh, how do you manage or prevent dental abscess in children, especially those excellent hypophosphatemic ones and vitamin D who are prone to develop? Uh, so what are the uh, points we should tell the parents to prevent them? Firstly, very good oral hygiene measures. Uh, I am from a school of water. I prefer manual brushing. But in such case, I, I promote uh, electric toothbrush so that the oral hygiene is maintained. A. B is a uh, uh, periodic dental examination every six months. I personally take an X-ray every year so that the parents and I we know the status of the child's oral health. Third is topical fluoride. Last, we do it something called as prophylactic or dentist procedure. Those are like we do root canals for baby, which are prophylactic free done. There is no history, there is no trauma, but we do it just to save the uh, child's tooth. When we cover up that tooth with a crown so that the chances of the infection or you know the chances of any kind of periodontal getting affected reduces consequences. So we do a lot of prophylactic uh, treatment over there. We also do a couple of uh, fillings and then cover up with a crown. So that again, we prevent the chances of the infection. Thank you, thank you so much. So, uh, key point is dental care is as much important in rickets as we talk about the, uh, the bone health and the general health. And especially if they are resistant rickets or hypophosphatemic rickets, we have to take additional extra care about the dental health. With this, I really thank all the uh, uh, panelists uh, who have gathered here and uh, given us their valuable inputs. I, uh, any questions from the audience since we have a whole lot of team which is here? If they like, before we give you the yes, yes, so in children, there is no scientific evidence which says that there is an orthogonal process of the jaw. In others, we have uh, there is scientific evidence which says so, but as I said, a dentist checkup also helps us understand the status three uh by functional doses and four functional uh by functional doses. So it's always better to do a dental checkup, but third one. Especially if you should have four multiple yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Any questions? I think we are not bad on the ten minutes beyond the schedule so I think I'll just officially conclude at this time. So thank you all for uh, coming, finding time and coming here to attend this CME. And I would like to thank our uh, sponsors, Torrent Pharmaceuticals, who have uh, helped us in organizing the CME. And I would uh, like to thank our uh, support team, Mr. Mangal, who has been from IT department, and our FNB team, who has kind of you know kept us nourished throughout this CME. So thank you very much. And we hope to meet soon in near future on some other topic. Thank you.
please collect your certificates and uh, if you have filled the delegate uh, feedback forms, kindly give it so that uh, you can come to know what your areas are for there for improvement. Thank you.